Hey everybody, come on in, come on in live. Uh, we're going for this International Women's Health Day and we are gonna be talking about women's health issues here today. So uh, if you have a women's health question, today's the day, welcome, welcome, come on in. <clears throat> welcome everybody. <clears throat> so uh, today is International Women's Health Day. So we are gonna be talking about some women's health issues and busting some myths. I love busting myths. Hey, how's it going? So uh, we're actually gonna be uh, just getting people in, asking some questions, uh, answering. Then we're gonna shift over and we're gonna take out the iPad and we're gonna be actually drawing and, and taking questions from everybody. So today, if you have a question and you want it answered, there's a little question button you can put on the bottom of your screen, there's a little question mark. And if you put a question in there, we are likely to answer it. Um, there's gonna be too many questions in the feed. Women's, International Women's Health Day, <clears throat> yes, yes. Um, pelvic floor issues, we are definitely talking about. We are gonna be drawing out, we're gonna be talking about prolapses and relapses and everything else you can imagine. <clears throat> Fibromyalgia, yes, we'll be talking about that as well. So if you have a specific question, yes, somebody's already doing it. Hit the little, the third button on the bottom of your screen, there's a little question mark, a little bubble. <clears throat> Hit that and ask your question in there. We will be answering questions out of there today, not out of the feed. And the reason is, is that we need a little bit of a logical order. We're gonna be preparing for them. So um, these days it's hard to find skin dryness. Uh, that's interesting. Can hysterectomy cause liver? And yes, absolutely it can. So we'll be talking about, these are good questions. If you have a question, uh, go down to the bottom and that little bubble, put it in there. We're gonna have to do this more organized today because I am gonna be taking out the laptop. I'm gonna be taking the human anatomy. I'm gonna be drawing through. Because a lot of times I talk about this stuff, I have the picture in my head, but you don't have the picture in your head. So, <clears throat> welcome South Africa, welcome, welcome. 72 years, <clears throat> wow. Do you guys uh, know the 72 names of God? Do you know the 72 degrees axis? The earth supposedly rotates on one degree axis every year, the equinox. Wow, 72 is a powerful number. Seven plus two is nine, which means I act, I am, as taking action. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We will be taking some people live too. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna do that, but we are taking questions. I see I got 14 questions here. Um, and let's see what kind of questions we got so far. Okay, diets for pre perimenopause. That looks pretty good, perimenopause. Replace, uh, replacement uh, therapy safe. Yeah, hormone replacement, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> Pain caused by Lyme disease. Yes, my favorite. Oh, I you guys will love me when I say I don't believe in Lyme disease. Uh, what's the best help for ovarian cysts? Okay, we will assist you with that one. Um, da -da -da -da. Thoughts on bioidentical hormones? Yes, we'll get to that. Uh, gain mind body during uh, midlife? Yes, we'll get to that. <clears throat> Anxiety, uh, so long now, I'm feeling uh, difficulty swallowing. Okay, for you who have anxiety for so long right now, I want you to go to our YouTube and do our upper reset. It'll take you 15 to 20 minutes, or 30 minutes. I want you to go do that. Um, and actually just do the first part of it, the stress reset, and the first part of the jaw release and that, and come back to us. Cause that way you're gonna be able to hear what we're gonna say. And that's, it uh, uh, looks like uh, Nalisha. Um, Cause otherwise you're not even gonna hear what I'm gonna say. So go do that first. The hysterectomy cause liver and call issues. Yes, yes, okay, good. Release fascia from pelvis, uh, womb to connect. Yes, we'll get into that. These are great questions. So if you have a question today, do not put it in the feed put it in the question button. And then that way, and um, we're gonna be doing this with a little bit more order going forward. Uh, we're gonna be starting to stream on other platforms and we're gonna be bringing people in so we have thousands of people. How to increase HDH at 60 years old. Okay, that's a good one too, we'll get to that. <clears throat> but uh, take your question, put it down there in the little bubble on the, on the bottom. It's the, it's the second bubble over from the right. Uh, hit that, ask a question. Just did the organ reset, feel great. Just received my fascial flow and fascial foundation, yeah. Hey, listen, um, uh, this is for uh, Hayes, oh, Petra. Hey, Petra. Um, the Eximash, if you are from there. Or, so um, uh, what you do, Petra, is take the fascial foundation. As a matter of fact, why don't you do this since you just received, you haven't taken yet. Take two of the fascial foundation and wait 30 minutes Get an idea how you feel right now. Wait 30 to 40 minutes and, and before the end of this call, let us know how you feel. Then once you feel that, then you take two fascial flow, 
wait 30 to 40 minutes. And then that way your, your nervous system gets programmed to the feeling of it. <clears throat> okay, we're going to go through ovarian cyst. Capricorn, Sun, Virgo, Moon, and Sag rising. Wow. <clears throat> you, Sandra, you've got a lot of characteristics like me. Yes, absolutely. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Today's going to be good. International Women's Day. We're going to be answering questions. Today we're going full poll though. We're going to be taking and putting out the iPad, answering some really, really detailed questions. Um, let's get some moderators in here too. Uh, anybody who is in our programs, uh, just let me know you're here and we'll get you moderating because there's going to be a lot of questions. I got a feeling. Um, um, so multiverse, many, uh, many dongers. Okay. Look at four, like questions are coming up there. Yeah, so questions in the bottom. And we will, we'll get to them. Today, we're gonna spend, uh, uh, and we also have a female doctor that's gonna be here today. I'm, you know what, I, first of all, I just gotta answer, I just gotta say something about the question. So we put out a uh, women's health issue, and then I get all these women there, like another man mansplaining women's health issues. It's not right that a man explains it. And I'm like, guys, Anybody can help anybody should help anybody. It doesn't matter if female or, or male. It makes no sense. <clears throat> Cynthia, add as a moderator. Thank you for letting me know. <clears throat> if you're a part of our program, just, uh, just actually say something so I can see you, so I can add you as a moderator. How can I heal my thyroid? Well, that's a simple one. Simple one, thyroid. We're going to get to that one. <clears throat> Thyroid's the simplest of them all. Um, <clears throat> Trump 2024. Hmm. Wait till you find out everybody's on the same side. <laughs> uh, yes, I used to encrypt data for the governments of the world and all the secret agents. Yes, I know things that people don't know. And <clears throat> I just think that a lot of people are going to be shocked by the end of this year. Hi from Vancouver. How are you doing, uh, Tamara from Vancouver? Good. Come on in. Okay, guys, uh, getting your questions. I'm looking at them. There's some great questions coming up here. Wow. <clears throat> how, to uh, how to increase... Okay, I'm going to take a couple of these right now. How to reduce cortisol levels to help shrink uh, uh, belly. Okay, so if you're 52-year-olds and you're having a belly issue, you'll notice that I had a belly issue. I'm going to show you my belly issue. This is when I started doing fascia work. Um, I didn't change anything, but I all of a sudden, one day... I just started, my belly started coming out and I didn't try to fight it. I was trying to figure out what the heck's going on. It was super weird, didn't make sense to me. But <clears throat> there's my belly issues. Boom, boom. And uh, I had been lean and muscular my whole life. Uh, I started doing the fascia work and you see right there on the back, see right around the rib cage, how tight it was? That is actually my stomach and my spleen. I'm a Sagittarius. That was all about, <clears throat> that whole issue was all about fear and worry and desire. And I wasn't living out my desires, lots of worry. And the belly goes out, so it has to tighten up in the back to hold me there. But that happened when I started doing fascia work. I couldn't understand why. And I didn't under, because my whole life I had been either muscular or fairly lean. And I didn't change anything. As a matter of fact, I eat about 75% less there than I was the, the years previous. And I just gained weight. And that was the release of trauma from my system. And this is when I started developing a different view of it. So. The way for um, a 50-year-old or 60 or 70-year-old women to reduce belly fat is to remove the stress twice a day. If you remove the stress twice a day from your body, you simply do the stress reset and the organ reset. Just that twice a day, you're going to have a change in 30 days. But it takes 28 consistent days of an action <clears throat> for your nervous system to reset and believe. This is why when you go to rehab, that's why you don't go to rehab for like three days a week or four days a week. You go to rehab for 28 days in a row. Because that's how you make a change. And if you don't do it that way, you're not going to make a change. So take the stress out. Um, and the other, the other biggest issue with weight right now is hydration. <clears throat> so hydration is a big issue. So a second here. Can we? Okay, so the next one. What about belly fat and weight loss and perimenopause? Yes, <clears throat> same thing. Work out every day, eat healthy, no weight loss. It's because your body's still holding on to the trauma. Guys, I'm going to tell you this. I, I, I did an experiment for two years. I went into the clinic as I started showing my belly coming out. And what I did <clears throat> was I went into the clinic and from uh, I weigh myself at 7 a.m. in the morning, 6 to 7. <clears throat> Usually at 6.30ish. I would weigh 215 every morning. 
by the end of the day, I'd weigh 225 every day, okay? The thing was, <clears throat> I would drink two liters of water, which is basically a Pepsi bottle. I don't know what that is in gallons or quarts. And I drank two liters of water throughout the day fasted, come home at seven o'clock or eight o'clock at night, weigh myself and I'd be 225. And I did all these lab tests and hydration tests and everything like this. And I'm like, how can I be gaining <clears throat> weight when I'm not taking that much in? The water doesn't weigh that much and I'm sweating all day. That was one of my biggest, uh, biggest experiences because I, I learned that weight is not commensurate with the calories that I intake. And this is where I started to believe that food was not a fuel, it was a medication. And the fuel itself is what our body produced. So <clears throat> you're gonna find out real quick as you reduce the stress every day that things are gonna change. So weight loss and perimenopause, and actually if you're in perimenopause and you do the fashion maneuvers or you do the 28 day reset, you might come out of perimenopause. Um, any tips on why we gain mid <clears throat> body fat during midlife? Ah, same issue. Is as we go on in life, why is it that we gain? Like I can work harder in my 40s and 50s and still not have the result. Now that's no longer true. I can do two weeks. For those of you guys who've been watching me, like, like my body has changed my shoulders and this is two, na two weeks of doing a new movement process in the water, which I'm gonna share with you guys, that actually completely rehabilitates the fascia. And, and my body now responds like it did when it was 18, where I can go and work out for two weeks and have a change in my body. The only reason it doesn't is because there's so much accumulation of trauma and stress in the body that the body has to get over. So <clears throat> fascial maneuvers takes it out, but that's why you get it. And the midsection is because that's where all your organs are. Your organs are in your midsection and those organs are holding emotions and the water is sitting there around those organs waiting to clean out the emotions. The water is literally <clears throat> the, um, uh, the uh, cleaning agent. It's, it's what... What am I saying? I can't even remember the name of it. It is, <clears throat> what's when something cleans? Man, I can't even think of it. Okay, forget it. Best part, uh, best kind of diet for peri perimenopause. Um, <clears throat> the best kind of diet you can always do is no chemicals. It don't matter really what your diet style is. It's like you're gonna argue over vegan versus carnivore versus paleo versus West Beach versus Atkins. I don't really care what the diet is. <clears throat> what I care about is that you get the proper minerals. And if you get the proper minerals in your body, the diet's not gonna matter so much. And if you get rid of stress twice a day, the diet's not gonna matter so much. So, so if I give you a diet plan and it doesn't resonate with you, you're all gonna try it and then it's not gonna resonate. Learning to do what resonates with you at the time and learning to also be willing to change it. But the best kind of diet is one that has no chemicals, that's it. And when I say organic, it's a tough one because organic isn't always organic. Can stress cause arm and shoulder pain? <clears throat> Absolutely. Stress can cause any kind of pain in the body. Um, really simply, just go do our 15 minute stress reset, organ reset, the stress, uh, the, the pain usually starts to go away. We have an upper reset, and lower reset that you can go on our YouTube. <clears throat> is stress stored in the hips? <clears throat> stress is stored anywhere in your body. What is stress? Okay, let's define stress. Is stress work? No. Is it the government? No. Is it your taxes? No. Is it your children? No. Is it driving in traffic? No. That's not stress. Those are stressors. Stress is my biological response to that. And if I'm hung over and someone's doing something loud, I'm like, oh, I can't listen anymore if I'm hung over. That's what happens when your body's hung over. So if your body's hung over from <clears throat> stress and anxiety, from managing stress and anxiety, then everything's going to feel uncomfortable. Okay, so if you want a question answered, you gotta go to the bottom uh, and there's a question answer button. Uh, any tips on why we gain mid, okay, we got that one. <clears throat> um, best kind of diet for perimenopause women? Whoa, we are like, everybody's asking. Okay, that's the second one. Can stress cause, uh, okay, got it. Does hysterectomy cause liver and gall issue? Yes, <clears throat> um, if you're gonna take out your, <clears throat> you're gonna do a hysterectomy, it's gonna change the way your hormones operate. If your hormones operate differently, your liver, your gallbladder, everything like that is used to working a certain way. Your liver is your pharmacy. What it does is you have 400 known functions, 400,000 variations. So that pharmacy is analyzing your blood every, uh, every two minutes. Um, I think it's every 45 seconds it circulates. I have to go back and, and look again, but it's analyzing the blood. It's seeing what's in the blood, what needs to go in, what needs, what's not there, what to put it in. 
So when you, <clears throat> you take out a major component of the anatomy, the body has to act differently and the hormones dysregulate. Your hormones will start to rebalance over time if you give them the ability to start doing it. And that's why we do it by moving and taking the stress out. Fascial maneuvers will help. With the hysterectomy, what you wanna do is you wanna do the um, partnered belly button uh, on torque and the partnered belly uh, iliocinqual valve release. <clears throat> and you wanna do those right away with a hysterectomy. And then you wanna do the lower reset minimum once a day and you wanna do that a minimum for 28 days. You are going to have a massive release of trauma at some point in those 28 days, my guess is. How to release fascia from uh, pelvis wound to connect. Okay, um, uh, I just said it, the belly button untorque. If you can get somebody to partner with you and do the belly button untorque and the uh, partnered uh, iliocinqual valve release, um, you're going to have uh, a much different experience, but do the lower reset. Do that lower reset <clears throat> one to two times per day. Over 28 days, you're going to have fascia relief from your pelvic floor for sure. Best kind of diet for perimenopause. Again, <clears throat> what is fascia maneuver? Um, yeah, well, I could tell you all about fascia maneuvers, or you can right now, um, uh, you can go to the link in the bio, try the 15 minute stress reset. Um, this is your first time, you can come back live in 15 minutes and tell us what you think fascia maneuvers are. It'll be an experience, it'll change your life, I promise you. <clears throat> Would love help with uh, uh, parenthesis and vertigo related to sinuses. Um, <clears throat> love, yes, absolutely, but you can go do our, lower, our upper reset. The upper reset is on our YouTube, you can get to it through the link in the bio. Make sure you get your body hydrated and anti-inflammatory, so our, our foundation bundle of supplements will work. Um, otherwise, you can download our supplement guide. You can look for alternatives. We don't say that you have to buy our supplements. We just want you to have the items that you can use. Um, we do not believe in long-term supplementation. We believe that the body is under a lot of stress right now and needs a little help. That's it. We need a cleaning agent. Like, if your counters are a little bit dirty, <clears throat> you can just wipe them off with water. If they're really sticky and gooey and greasy, you gotta use a solvent. You can use water, eventually it'll come off, but the solvent will help you get it there faster. That's what supplements are like. Can stress car, okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, um, middle round of procedure done in 2009, ongoing. Okay, uh, for the procedure in 2009, ongoing bowel problems, hypertension. Uh, okay, immediately foundation bundle supplements or diatomaceous earth and Irish sea moss. So hypertension, all the stuff that you're talking, the bowel issues is all related to, in my opinion, dehydration of the fascial tissue and the organs, um, and do the lower reset one to two times per day. You should have a change in that within the first 28 days, usually within the first week. Bad cold, what to do? <clears throat> Sweat it out, get in the bath, um, drink some teas, uh, do fascial maneuvers, do your lower reset and your upper reset. Do them twice a day, let your body detox. The cold is there, it, it'll, it'll move faster when your body is clear. Constant phases of fear of everything. <clears throat> okay, so if you're constant phases of fear of everything, um, take the foundation bundle of supplements, get the inflammation out. The body means your body is in fear. So get the fear out of your body. Do the lower reset minimum twice per day. Just do it twice per day, do it for two weeks straight. Um, the fear will abate itself and then you'll start to have reasoning because right now, Unless you do that, you're never gonna get out of that cycle. It's like a, it's like a bucket you can't climb out of. <clears throat> Can you give, uh, please give advice on asthma relief. Um, asthma relief, uh, do our upper reset, do it every day. Take, uh, get your body hydrated, get the lungs hydrated, diatomaceous earth, Irish sea moss. Um, uh, as long with the, uh, uh, with the upper reset, do the elbow, <clears throat> shoulders, any of the bending, any of the rib cage releases and uh, your asthma will change for sure within the first month. To what degree, it depends on how much you do. Any recommendations for bench top water filters? Uh, bench top water filters, uh, Alcaviva is the one we use. If you need something che cheap and portable, the, the Berkey, which we also use. Uh, you never know when you have to uh, filter your toilet water to drink, so we have a Berkey for that. <clears throat> yeah, that's yes, right, you can filter your dark circles under your eyes. Do the upper reset twice a day. Get yourself some hydration. Diatomaceous earth, Irish sea moss, it'll go away in usually under 30 days. What helps recurring issues with Achilles tendon? Lower reset. <clears throat> um, the barefoot sprinter routine number two. Lower reset, barefoot sprinter routine number two. 
uh, foundation bundle of supplements. Again, the minimum is diatomaceous earth, Irish sea moss. You'll hear me say that over and over again. It's because the reason why is because we're breathing air and eating food, which is dehydrating our body. Yeah, it's, de it's de making us deficient in silica. <clears throat> I've worked my whole life. And at 40, I started getting pains in my lower back, right side. I've done physio, acupuncture. It feels like the right hip is off. Okay, fibro, 39. So <clears throat> lower right side, it's usually about grief. That grief is uh, usually about the, the masculine side. So your father, masculine energy, the, <clears throat> this world. Fibromyalgia indicates to me that you had early childhood trauma, usually um, do the lower reset um, and uh, do the lower reset, uh, take the supplements or the diatomaceous earth, Irish sea moss, talk to me in two weeks, you probably don't have a hip issue or a lower back issue. How to get rid of extreme fatigue in early 40s, uh, hydrate your body, get the stress out. Do they, you know what, early 40s, if you have extreme fatigue, do the 28 day reset. Like uh, again, you can pick at this, but you're at that stage where you need, to, you need to take and say, I've done something wrong for 40 years. Now I'm gonna do something right. Give yourself a month, do that, six weeks. <clears throat> something I do to get rid of hypertension on my face. Uh, yeah, the upper reset. Go to do the upper reset right now. You can do that in 30 minutes. You can come back, take a before picture and after picture. Show us in 30 minutes, we'll still be here. I'll bring you up live or I'll, I'll post that picture if you do that. You, uh, and this is for uh, it looks for like Tobaya, uh, Sarika. <clears throat> so you want to do that? Go to the mirror, take a before picture, do the upper reset. You'll be back here in 30 minutes. Do the after picture. Uh, send it to us, um, or say you have it, uh, and we'll bring you up. <clears throat> I'm super interested, but we'll we'll post it if you do before and after picture, because yeah, you're doing it live. There's like no better way to do it. Is lymph drainage important on our detox? Should we be opening lymph? Uh, when you do fascia maneuvers, it automatically opens the lymph. Uh, just do fascia maneuvers. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> I'm taking high quality food grade powder DE and it's making my eyes upper lower swollen. I have hyperthyroidism. Okay, so you have to do the upper reset. If you take diatomaceous earth and you're not moving the fascia, you're gonna have issues come up. So let's do that upper reset. Do we intentionally keep pelvic blocks squeezed throughout the movements? If you can, as much as you can, please do it. Um, <clears throat> severe lumbar pain, 57 years old, starting menopause. Simple, simple, simple. Just uh, go do the lower reset, go do that right now. And this is for, looks like Sajida um, Habib, uh, 14. Go do the uh, lower reset, it'll take you 15 minutes, take it before and after photo, come back and tell us what happens. Uh, if you're starting menopause and you don't want to, then uh, I suggest you do the 28 day reset, uh, get your body out of stress. I have women that are in their mid fifties and late fifties coming out of menopause right now. And you may or may not want to, but why don't you give your body the decision and instead of your brain. How to take stress out for 28 days. Uh, it's, it's literally our 28 day reset, or you can just do the stress reset and the organ reset, do it twice a day. Super simple. It's 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes at night. Uh, it'll change your life, guaranteed. Um, when I say guaranteed, I mean guaranteed. There's no way that you can take stress out every day for 28 days and not have a measurable result. Now, you may need to measure a couple different things, but one of them is definitely gonna be attitude, stuff like that. Uh, one of them is gonna be your body, body tension. Retired nurse, body failing me. Thank you as a nurse for doing what you're doing. You don't need to go anywhere for help. You're already there. And this is MZ Moon 711. So um, 711, you're like the 7-Eleven at every, every corner stair there to meet everybody's needs, right? Okay, so uh, here's what you do. Go in and do the 28-day reset. Lots of nurses and practitioners are doing it. You have lots of trauma stored in your body usually because you've been working with people. That's my recommendation, especially since you're retired. Uh, we'll help you through it. Okay, go uh, to the link in the bio, start the 28 day reset. Okay, uh, so we've got some people coming in. Ah, awesome. Menopause doesn't have to be experienced at all. Yes, okay, so, uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get into some pelvic floor issues. <clears throat> is that what we're gonna do? Is we're ready to start doing that? I think so, yeah. Okay, so uh, can you look at the questions or do you have to look online? No, but I've been right here. Okay. So you can scour through them and, okay. So uh, 
We're gonna we're gonna introduce you to. It's a birthday. What? Happy birthday. Who's happy birthday? This one right here. Okay, so guys, <laughs> happy uh, birthday. I'd like to Hello, introduce Pisces. you to somebody. Ija, want you come over here? This is Ija. Say hello. Hi. Ija is a medical doctor from Canada. Uh, she also has studied acupuncture and Chinese medicine for a long time. So uh, throughout the course of today, we're going to be at, uh, talking a little bit ourselves about what her experience is because she started doing the fascia maneuvers and it's transforming your life. Absolutely. We were just having a deep discussion about how much it transformed her life and her relationships with her children and her husband. Yeah. And here's, a, here's the best part. Then you can stop saying there's a man mansplaining women's issues, right? <laughs> you guys are so funny, man. It's like, it, take the information. It doesn't matter who gives it to you. Okay, so uh, let's head over and uh, is the iPad ready to go? Okay, let's, uh, we're going to head over and we're going to talk about pelvic floor issues. Actually, you want to sit and we're going to talk on the iPad. So we're going to talk on there, right? Okay. okay, let's do this. Let's do this, everybody. Wait, <clears throat> Yeah, we're going to wander over here. So where are we going? Don't look like you're quite set up yet. Yeah, we are. We're set up. We're all set up. Okay, here we go. You want to grab another chair for Ija? Yeah. Is that to keep the... It's, it's slightly... Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's do this. Okay, let's talk about some common women's issues. Um, okay, upgrade. Oh, can you, uh, male, female. Okay, there we go. First of all, we're going to change it to a female. Okay, well, how, do you, how do you deal with, uh, with people that are transgender out of curiosity that come in and they want to be, I mean, we still have to deal with them from a medical perspective based on their biology, right? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you say when they, when they say, no, I want to be identified as a male out of curiosity? To be honest, I haven't had any dealing with, I haven't had encounters. No? no? Okay, you have to talk up a little bit more. So, okay. Yeah, so you haven't had any encounters. No. That's interesting. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about some of the, what are some of the most common pelvic floor issues you see? Mm, incontinence. Incontinence, yeah. okay. Let's talk, and that, that's happening with even young women today, right? Younger, <laughs> like in their 40s? Uh, it can be, yeah. And it can happen after pregnancy, after, pregnancy, right? after, after pregnancy, after childbirth. After pregnancy, after childbirth, yeah. More women are becoming proactive in doing their pelvic floor during pregnancy mm -hmm. and immediately after. <clears throat> So more women are becoming uh, proactive, okay? Mm -hmm. So we have, just for you guys, everybody who I do this to, they always say, why are you using a man's body? <laughs> and it's because I'll take these off. I'll go like this and I'll hide this. Uh, I'll hide. Oh, wow, they've actually improved the app. Well, they improved it again. Look at that. I, I hide that. And then just so you guys, I don't want you to think, I have, since there, we've taken that one, the mammary gland here. We'll leave this one here because I have fond memories of this one. <laughs> Okay, so let's take this off. Hide, hide, uh, hide, <coughs> hide, hide. Wow, this is like a lot more than it used to be. So, uh, so most people don't know, but we have four layers of muscle and fascia for the pelvic floor, or for the abdominal wall. So if I isolate this, look at this. That's my abs right over here. So most people don't know that. Um, so let's take that off. Let's hide that one. And see how, and what I like to point out is all the striations or all the method of movement is different on each one. So if we isolate this, I just want to show you guys what you're made of. You see how far that one comes back? That's kind of cool. And then we will take that off. Then we go here. <coughs> Whoops. We isolate that one. We'll fade it. Uh, isolate. So then this one here, this is where, this is where we get the hole, this is where the belly button goes. So this one, this layer is so that we can rotate around. So the other layers are about force going left and right, up and down. This one is actually rotational. And there's belly. actually a, a gap there. Yeah, a gap yeah. for the belly button. Mm -hmm. And this one, you see how far it goes back over here? That's mm -hmm. what I love. And, and we don't normally, like, even when we study anatomy, we don't look at it this way normally because we used to have to look at anatomy books. Anatomy books were really frustrating because you have five books out to get the same picture. So this is what I believe helped me understand the human body. All right. Okay, now here, here is the infamous 10-pack. Now, I uh, traded my 6-pack or my 10-pack in for a keg when I got out of high school. So my keg was, I wanted a 1-pack. <laughs> so, so we'll get rid of that. 
So I wanted everybody to see this and see what it looks like. Because most people don't get a chance. This is the greater momentum. This is where all of the nutrients goes into the bloodstream from the organs. It doesn't look this way when we were talking about this last night. It doesn't really look like this when we do an autopsy um, or a cadaver lab. So if I hide that, now I get all the squiggly tissue. I'm going to get rid of these ones real quick just so we can talk about it. <clears throat> it's a little skill. And then, of course, we have the lily alba. Um, this here is a ligament that keeps our internal integrity. So when a woman gets pregnant, what happens here is this guy stretches out. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the major causes of diastasis recti. Mm -hmm. And this ligament here, when we put it back here, it has all these pulling sensations because it stretches this way and this way. So this is a common issue is seeing the diastasis recti in women. So fascial maneuvers can be good for repairing that? Right, yes. Non-surgically? Non-surgically, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, look at my diastasis recti. I mean, I went from, I went from having the big belly mm -hmm. to having, and, and what's, what's important, when I got rid of my belly, I actually had that little line up underneath the belly button. Looks like I had excess weight. Well, that all went away too. So eventually this can all go away. And usually what we do for this is we just, vis we do the belly button torque. We put our finger in there and torque this way. We do the ileocinchal valve release here, the partnered one. And this starts to let all of these areas here, this area here, lets all of this friction go here. Because we torque it like this, it torques like this. So it winds it up and then lets it elastically go back. So pretty cool. Again, it's just a winding motion, right? Oh, we got a pen. My gosh, they've kept the pen away from me. Okay, so let's get rid of the, this. Okay, so now we have the intestines. Now, why do we have all of these different versions of intestines, little areas? Do you know? The different areas. Yeah, but they do different functions. Different functions. Um, and we, we kind of know what some of the functions are, but I don't believe we know what them all. But if I isolate this... That's pretty interesting. So this is the very, the very first part as it's coming in right from the stomach. So this area here is where it gets a lot of processing power, a lot of stuff done. So like when this area is agitated, I feel it in my organs. Like I'll feel it in my throat. I'll feel it in my neck. I'll feel it tension ha happen right away. But I find that in my experience, this area here is where all the skin conditions start to come up. Mm -hmm. Helium. And again, whoops. I'm going to isolate that. <clears throat> Again, it's a little, little different, but this is like through the whole front of the stomach and it's covering other organs. So let's get rid of these. Okay, now we have our, we have our ascending, our transverse, and our descending colon. And we have the ligament which goes over the uterus. So this is a ligament. And this ligament here is super powerful. It's maintaining the pelvic floor structure. So let's, let's take that out, it's isolated here so you can see what it looks like. That's what it looks like, it's pretty cool. Look at that little hole up there, that's where it goes in. It's pretty cool when you think about it. Uh, how is this constructed? And look at there, even so it carries the fallopian tubes. Mm -hmm. So the fallopian tubes can easily get dislodged out of there and when we do that we feel pain, like a, it almost feels like somebody's pressing in there or it feels like a gas pain quite often. Okay, and I don't know that because I don't have it, but I've experienced lots of women that I've helped resolve it. Okay, and so on top of the ligament, we've got the bladder, and we've got the uterus. Now the bladder, uh, now what happens, what I've experienced is, is as the pelvis tilts forward, the bladder starts to push against here, and the, fat, and the bladder gets stuck right on the pelvic floor. That's quite often the, one of the biggest issues. So if the bladder gets stuck on the pelvic floor, here, I'll show you what it does. In my experience, if the bladder gets stuck right here, right here, so it pulls the, the hips anterior, so it pulls it forward. So you notice a lot of women pulling with the anterior and the shoulders rolling mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Very, very common. So that's an issue. So let's get right into, okay, so here... Let's take out the bladder here. And then, by the way, just for you women who haven't seen this, when this gets bigger here, it's going to push against there. That makes sense why you've got to go pee all the time. Mm -hmm. And if the bladder, if this here gets dysregulated, if the hips are forward, 
this can easily push into the bladder, causing me to have to go to the bathroom more. Are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you experience that? Yes, after childbirth. I think most mothers experience going frequently. Do you experience it during your cycle? Um, not Maybe not, not you. Me. Yeah, no. but you're very well moving. Mm-hmm. But the other women experience, mm-hmm. uh, we'll call them period shits, they call them. <laughs> <laughs> Or the, the movements, because also when that gets big, it pushes against here, which is your which is your colon, right up against here. And there's some dis- debate. And I'm going to open that up right now to how big this gets during the cycle. I have um, I have sco- I have looked at it on um, ultrasound. ultrasound, and I found that it gets to about 50 percent bigger. Um, and there's this peer review that says it only grows three or four percent. Does that seem logical to you? That it only grows three or four percent? Could be. Could be. Yeah. But it could be also could getting be bigger. Also bigger. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so when what happens when some women get really bloated and some women don't? Yeah. Right. What do What do you think that is? It's true. A lot of women do experience that they are bloating more. We always associate bloating with gas, but this idea that it could be the uterus that they're actually feeling. Right, right, right. yeah, yeah. So, and, and it can be gas too. It's, it's, it's both of those. Yeah. So let's take the bladder out. By the way, when I, remember I said it, it's a... Whoops, I'm going to get rid of that. Um, how do I get rid of that? Oh, back. Okay, so I'll hide it. But see, there you go. There's, there's the inside of the bladder too. And that's pretty interesting when you think about it because the bladder actually separates right in the front. Remember I said all the organs that move us, of fear is one of the motivators, which is the bladder, is one unit that has two sides. It's kind of interesting. So, so let's take a look at this. Okay, there, there it is. See the uterus here. It comes, now the bladder was right in here. So if the, as the uterus here starts to enlarge, then it pushes right down on top of the bladder, pushing it forward. That's the yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where we feel a lot of the pressure. That's where we feel a lot of pain, especially during pregnant. Okay, now what about a tilted uterus? What do you see in practice? You've seen, do you actually recognize tilted uterus? Um, on a clinical exam, but never, you know, in Western medicine, I don't think we go beyond just... Uh, it's tilted. Yeah, we'll go, it's tilted. Yeah. But regardless of what that means for a woman's experience. What does that mean when in Eastern medicine that you practice? Like for tilted, do you do something about it or? Mm, no, you know, the only, the only thing that I've done for women with um, prolapse issues yeah. is treating the, through the top of the, the head. The top of the head, perfect. Mm-hmm. Okay, you actually use needles for that. And moxibustion. Oh, moxibustion, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So that's a moxie you burn. Mm-hmm. Doesn't that burn their hair? You have to be above the hair. <laughs> Okay, so so what is it in your definition? What is a prolapse? What is it? What is it actually doing? Mm, well, just the heaviness, sinking, something that's no longer held where it's need to be. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's get some stuff out of here. Let's look at what a prolapse looks like. Okay, uh, let let me take off some muscles here. Let's get rid of the muscles for a second. That way, it's a little easier to see. Okay, there. I'll get rid of some bones here. Uh, let's get rid of the femur too. Whoops, didn't want to do that. Uh, let's just make it easier to see. Okay, there's the, uh, let's get rid of the, the arm. <clears throat> so let's look at the uterus. Whoops, let's bring it back here. Let's look at it from this side. Okay, so let's turn it a little bit more. There, that's, that's a better way to sit. So this uterus here has this shape. So a prolapse would be a malfunction here causing this to get heavy and come down there. Mm-hmm. So what could happen? What could be the cause of that? Well, look how this is influenced by the hips, the spine, and right here by the lower colon. So if I had colon issues, a lot of women today are only going to bowel movement sometimes every second or every third day. Mm-hmm. So if I have a bowel movement every second or third day, what's going to happen is... I'm gonna get a buildup of poop in there. I know what you're saying, no shit, but yes. So I'm gonna get buildup there. That's gonna push on the uterus. And if that pushes on the uterus, then that's gonna cause the potential of a prolapse. Mm -hmm. So so this is one reason we want people to have a bowel movement every day. Minimum actually one per day, but we want two or three or even four movements a day. 
Okay. And why the squatting is so important. Right, because when we squat, it opens up the pelvis and it allows the pressure to come off because the, because the, uh, the, um, the rectum starts to fold underneath the uterus. So the rectum, the uterus stays sit, and when we squat the pelvis, so the rectum comes underneath the uterus. And so it actually uses that power to, to get rid of it. That's why we should have a squatty potty. So if you guys don't know what a squatty potty is, oh, we don't actually have an affiliate for a squatty potty. <laughs> Can we get an affiliate for a squatty potty, Jordan? Yeah. yeah. So if you want to look at squatty potty, go look at squatty potty. The video is one of the best videos I've ever seen. It's on YouTube. It's got millions of views. you ever seen it? I haven't, but I know what they are. Yeah. Oh, that's even worth showing people. Um, actually, that is worth showing people. Hold on a second here. I'm going to go to YouTube. I'm going to show you this because this one's... Can I do this on... Can I play a video on... Can I uh, squatty potty? I don't know. Here it is. Okay, here it is. This is where your ice cream comes from. The creamy poop of a mystic unicorn. Totally clean. Here. Turn it up. Soft serve straight from a sphincter. Here. You guys, this is why you should use a squatty potty. This is where your ice cream comes from. The creamy poop of a mystic unicorn. Totally clean. Totally cool and soft serve straight from a sphincter. Mmm, they're good at pooping. But you know who sucks at pooping? You do. That's because when you sit on a porcelain drone, it's muscle to kink in the hose and stops the Ben and Jerry's from sliding out smoothly. Is that a problem? I don't know. Are hemorrhoids a problem? Because sitting at this angle can cause hemorrhoids, bloating, constipation, and a buttload of other crap. And seriously, unicorn hemorrhoids? The glitter gets everywhere. But what happens when you go from a sit to a squat? Voila, this muscle relaxes and that kink goes away faster than Pegasus main sweet sherbet dookie. Now your colon's open and ready for battle. That's because our bodies were made to poop in a squat, and now there's a product that lets you squat in your own home. Introducing the Squatty Potty. <laughs> no, Squatty Potty is not a joke. And yes, it will give you the best poop of your life, guaranteed. I don't just mean you bloated lords and hemorrhoidal ladies. I mean everyone. <laughs> kink, unkink. Kink, unkink. It's simple science, really. Can't get the last scoop out of the carton. With the squatty potty, you get complete elimination. <laughs> Spend too much time on the chamber pot. The squatty potty makes it go twice as fast for your money back. I stream, you stream, and plop, plop, baby. Maybe you're sore from squeezing out solid globs of rocky road. <laughs> The squatty potty gives you a smooth stream of broyo that glides like a virgin swan. Plus, when you're done, it tucks neatly out of sight, thanks to its innovative pattern. Okay, design. we got that. That is an official commercial. That is an official commercial. <laughs> and it has been removed, uh, viewed 41 million times. So, uh, so it's why you should have a squatty potty. Because that little, that little line here pulls, that muscle pulls right around there. And that, and that also when we pull down there, it separates the rectum from the uh, uterus. Because if the rectum sits on the uterus and fascia is sticky, it's going to stick there. It's going to adhere because it thinks the body thinks it wants to be there. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So the, the way that we stop the adhesions is we keep the body hydrated. When the fascia is dehydrated even slightly, adhesions happen more. And that's why movement gets harder when we're dehydrated because there's more adhesions in the fascia. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so let's get back to this. Prolapsed uterus. So if my uterus is tilted, this way, okay? So what would that look like if the uterus was tilted this way? So what that means is in mechanics, let me take all of it off here. I'm gonna go right back to digestive issues. I'm gonna go right back to, whoops, uh, back to basics. I have to reset. So uh, I got the memories there again. I'm gonna take off the digestion and all this stuff. So let's just talk about some mechanics here, okay? So if my prolapse, if my uterus is going this way and then it goes this way, that means my hip has to be actually open up this way. So this hip is gonna be higher and this hip is gonna be lower. Now, almost everybody in the world has one higher hip and one lower hip. If it's dramatic, like a scoliosis, you're gonna get a you're gonna get a tilted uterus. Now, tilted, tilted uterus doesn't mean you're not gonna conceive, but it's one of the causes of of, of conception issues. And um, who just wants their uterus tilted? 
I don't know. Do you want your Yiddish? <laughs> okay. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about adhesions on the pelvic floor. Okay. Let's go back to here. Let's get this rid of it again. I wish there was a way to reset this easier, but I have to do this every time. So I've, I've spent the last 12 years using this to explain anatomy to people so that they could see it another way. I wish doctors could use something like this when they're counseling patients. They should. Especially surgeons, you know? The surgeon so should. many people are consenting to things and still not understanding. That, that's a big issue. Mm-hmm. I'm consenting to a surgery, but I don't understand what that surgery looks like. Mm-hmm. And if I understood the mechanics of it, would I still do the mm-hmm. surgery? And if, if, you know, speaking to doctors and teasing away all the layers, would they start to think differently about what they were doing? Well, I think if most doctors looked at it this way, this is how I learned the body. Yeah. I, le- I, I knew the body. I learned it here in the field. Like I touched the yeah. body and then I go look on here and say, this what did I touch? functional anatomy where I think we're still stuck in just the gross anatomy. Gross. You know, very simplistic. Yeah, very yeah. simplistic view. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so here's our pelvic floor, but here's some funny ones, okay? So you, these ones here, they wrap, this, this is like, so, in this tissue right in here. Okay, so this is, let's get rid of the quadrus, or the, um, man, I even forget muscles now. I'm starting to adductors. <laughs> okay, so this is really super important. Women who have a very, very tight neck, right around the base of the neck, this is tight. Now, I'm gonna suggest that women can stretch this out, like in a bathtub. I put, I put one, one finger here and one finger here when I'm in a bathtub sitting and I pull it apart and move my body so this stretches this out and stretches this out. That's gonna help a lot. It, it's, also, it's also a big issue with women who have, have pain during sex because there's gonna be contraction around here. That's the first area of contraction. And, but I wanna show you something. I wanna show you where this sucker goes to. So what happens is it goes right up into the rectum. So it's all connected here and it goes right up into the mm-hmm. rectum. And so if I, have, if, I have, uh, if I have my hips off, so let's, here, let's do this. So if I have my hips off and this hip is higher, guess what happens to my rectum? My rectum starts to tilt inside. Mm-hmm. So same thing. So that's a big issue for, for women. And, and I, I encourage women and men to go in there in the bathtub, grab those areas around the rectum, pull them, squeeze them, and breathe. We shouldn't be afraid to touch our bodies. People are like, it's going to break. Is that s-? I get this all the time. Is it safe to do that on my body? I'm like, if you're asking whether touching your body is safe, we have a real problem. Well, so what's your, I, what's your opinion on kegels? Because that's what's being done. Well, well, kegels is to try and strengthen something, but muscles lose strength because they're restricted from yeah. fascia. Mm-hmm. So we unrestrict the fascia, and then the muscles regain the strength. So we're doing kegels, which works. Exactly. But if you really want the ultimate kegels, release what's causing the muscle not to be able to... Which is up. what we're experiencing you know, in other aspects mm-hmm. of our body. You know, When you're showing me this, I'm just thinking of all the... The, the hemorrhoid clinics and the vulvodynia clinics and all these very specialized clinics that are focusing on these areas when here you're offering something. Else. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about hemorrhoids because mm-hmm. hemorrhoids are just liver issues. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I mean, you know that from, from Chinese medicine. Okay, so, but here's what I want people to see. It's okay, so if I take this muscle here, now there's fascia all around this. This all exists in there. If I isolate this and come all the way around, look at that muscle. Look, it goes right from the front it goes all the way around and it affects your tailbone. So how many people have a tailbone off? So this is very common. Most people's tailbone will go that way. Most people's tailbone will go to the left generally and their, and their xiphoid will go to the right because it's bouncing off. But well, that's going to affect the pelvic floor mm-hmm. and it's going to affect the, how the uterus and everything sits on there as well. Okay, so let's take a look at some other ones which are nasty ones which we don't even think of. Like we go back in here, okay, this is the, so I've noticed that the body has likes three. So we have a glute max, men, and med. Do you know that there's only one muscle that's not common? It's like, do you know that the psoas minor is only generally an Afri- African-American people? Oh. Yeah, it's uh, black or African-American have psoas minor. That's why in the 30s, that's why they didn't want to have them in the Olympics because it gives the body an advantage in propulsion. Isn't that funny, eh? <clears throat> Taking all the gender or the, the race issues out, we do have some differences biologically. So here, that's the glute uh, major. There is the gluteus 
<coughs> medius. And then under there is the minimus. Now, the way that the body works is this fires, transfers the force to the medius, that transfers the force to the maximus. But if my, if my pelvis is tilted, <coughs> this muscle here is strained, and I don't get the proper glute firing. So in order to get my glutes firing properly, I need to then clear it out. This is what fascial maneuvers will do, because when we rotate the hips, the hips and the shoulders, it lets this drop back down. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's take, let's take some funny ones. Like, okay, so I want to get in. Okay, let's, uh, let's get to okay, one of these ones. Okay, here it is, the quad, uh, quadratus femoris. Okay, if I isolate this. <clears throat> okay, so this one here controls. It's so powerful. So if this hip goes high, then this guy is automatic, automatically going to get stretched out because the hip goes this way. So it streps, stretches away and causes issue in here. Now, when we re relate that back to the pelvic floor, what that's going to do is it's going to cause a contraction of these fibers here to go the opposite way. So this one here goes, whoops, sorry. This fiber here goes this way because the other one's going that way. <clears throat> so what sits on top of there, now let's get back to what sits on top of there. Let's put down your angeals. Let's get this back in here and see how that affects stuff. So what happens is, see all these attachments here? Like these little attachments, they go right into the pelvic floor right there. They go, th and see they go through the connective tissue. They go through that fascia right into the pelvic floor. So if my fascia is contracted over here, and, if, and it can be tracted over here through fear around the bladder. If it's fear on the feminine side, I'm going to be contracted more. Literally, I'm going to have more contraction here on the masculine side over there. So it's going to pull and rotate the uterus. So that's one way. And this is all solved by fascial maneuvers. Mm -hmm. okay, what are some other common issues? <clears throat> Do we have any more? We have more, lots more. <clears throat> I know I'm a fan of what's efficient so okay. that you don't have to work hard to get a result because we're always focused on, you know, whether it's working on a muscle to strengthen something. But here, you know, when you're resolving things to the fascia, what I noticed even personally was, oh, the glutes started to engage on their own finally when they were not, and it didn't matter what you were trying to do. So these little muscles start to engage on their own. The reason why that happens is because when you do the rotations of the fascial maneuvers, it lets the hip settle. And so the glutes then start, these start firing again. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if my glutes fire, my glute minimus fires differently, which creates the levators to fire differently, which means that my pelvic floor is going to sit differently. My uterus is going to sit differently. Just think about all those obstructed labors. Right. Childbirth. Yeah, childbirth, obstructed mm -hmm. labors. Okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about some of the, the ones that everybody wants to know. Okay. So here's a really, really common one. Okay, let's get rid of the memories. It's just, ah, uh, actually, you know what? I'll leave them on. And the reason why I'll leave them on <clears throat> is because somebody will go, you've got a guy showing a guy. It's a picture of a guy. Oh, wow. How do I get back? Okay, there you go. Okay, so during pregnancy. Now, the human body is a bag. So the skin is a bag. There's pressure inside. We divide the pressure into three zones. We divide the pressure from here up, zone one, <clears throat> zone two to the pelvic floor, from here to here, and zone three. So if I change pressure here, it has to change pressure here and here, and vice versa. So what does that look like when you're pregnant? Well, when you're pregnant, this goes like this. So if that goes like that, it's pulling this way, the bag has to go this way. So women get shorter when they're pregnant. The average woman gets between an inch and a half and two inches shorter when they're pregnant. So, and, and for all you women out there who've gotten shorter when you're pregnant, do you wanna get your height back? So what happens is, is we have all this pressure out here, but what starts to support is this. You start to see that that all the muscles and fascia back here start to tighten to hold the body from going forward. Because if the body's right here, this has to tighten in order for this to go here. So this has to tighten because the force angle is down like this. Sorry, like this. So this is an area for women, if you want to re-get rid of your, your rect, dias recti, 
one of the areas to work is right here, is to make sure that this area is clear. Now we get this area clear with our anti-gravity fascial maneuver because we actually stretch that out. And that's pretty. Uh, Lisa, are you, um, do we have any other direct questions? Can, so, you, can you talk about um, mastectomies and lifting <clears throat> breast areas? Okay, so let's talk about the mastectomy. Um, how do you feel about mastectomies as a medical doctor? Uh, do you mean the reason why people go and have them? or? Well, I, I mean, doctors? we have them usually because of cancer. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe that cancer, is, do you treat cancer really differently than the regular medical establishment? Uh, yes, but I can't claim to treat cancer. You can't claim to treat... Mm -hmm. You can't claim to treat cancer? Is that a legal thing? Mm. Well, uh, How does that work? Mm -hmm. If anything, it's trying to... Again, it's a holistic approach trying right. to address... Um, oh, the whole body. Okay, okay. Uh, so you're treating it from the holistic approach. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't treat a disease either. Mm -hmm. Treat the whole body. But I mean, in medicine, we treat cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. But if we treat cancer, we're going to fail. We have to treat the whole body. Okay, so, um, so mastectomy. So what, what happens in a mastectomy from your point of view? Mm, well, physically, I mean, they might feel that they can remove the cancer, but then you're left with all the, the scars. Yeah. You don't know what's happening at a you know, blood vessel, cell level that way. Um, but I think the biggest thing is the scars. Um, and the disruption in, well, when I think in energy flow and also fascia as well. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah, so we got, this, we got the scars. So, and this is also, let's give another one for mastectomy, but also for uh, augmentation, breast augmentation, mm -hmm. either post or pre, either for aesthetics or not. So one of, what things for me is I actually, you can actually push your finger inside of my nipple. Go ahead, push it in, push hard. Feel that hole? Mm -hmm. I had a bilateral gynecomostia surgery. So I had my breast tissue removed because I was a bodybuilder and I didn't want to get what we call bitch tits. So I am very familiar with when people say, all you people say, how can a guy talk about breast augmentation and that because I had mine augmented. So yeah, reduction. reduction. Yeah, I had, a re I had a breast reduction. So, so normally what we're going to do is the, the most common treatments um, for uh, augmentation is we're going to cut right here. We're going to cut right here or we're going to cut right here. They all have different effects. So from a health perspective... Sometimes they have the down, down the... Yeah, they'll, they'll go... Oh, yeah, sorry. That's mm -hmm. actually... Oh, shoot. I got rid of them all. Here, here, and here. And sometimes they go right down there, which is, they, which is in my opinion, the same thing as the old C-section scars. Mm -hmm. It's like brutal. Like, why, why are we cutting through this? So around here, what are the things that are, that are affected when we, when we cut off the, the nipple? What are the... From a... From a uh, a holistic point of view. Mm, I mean, that's all the stomach. Stomach, channel. right? Mm -hmm. What is stomach? It's desire. Mm -hmm. So this affecting desire massively. So yeah, the stomach channel. And I guess what I've had my whole issue, my whole life, stomach issues. Mm -hmm. My entire life, I've had stomach issues. Okay, what about when we cut under here? Mm -hmm. Well, you're still transecting stomach. And depending how far out that goes, um, a bit of kidney. Kidney, mm -hmm. a little bit of spleen. Perhaps. Yeah. yeah, depending on where they do it. This one. Yeah, yeah, for sure spleen and gallbladder mm -hmm. over here. Yeah, uh, and, and, but, but we're going to, so if we affect the spleen, then what is one of the emotions that will happen? Mm, worry. Worry. Mm -hmm. So do you notice a lot of women today have worry? Do you notice women who have breast augmentations tend to worry a little bit more? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> yeah. It's hard to know which came first, though, sometimes. When you, you're having fair, those fair statement. Fair statement. But as a society looking at them, yeah. if I look at them, women who have breast augmentations have more worry generally is the way I feel. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then over here, we're going to get spleen or, or we're going to get gallbladder. Mm -hmm. but, and if I do this, what are some of the symptoms I might experience? And breast augmentation. If I get gallbladder, what's that going to affect? Uh, well, sometimes it could be things like their decision making, mm -hmm. their sense of courage, or frustration. Yeah, resentment, frustration, resentment. and and then what's it going to affect in the way that they eat and process? It's going to affect 
the way they digest food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so gallbladder being, um, gallbladder being uh, what we need for fats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's going to affect the bile production. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a pretty big price to pay for an augmentation. Now, what about somebody who already, so somebody who already has an augmentation. Here's what I've discovered. I've discovered that when we move the tissue around here, it, the body is really, really powerful. As soon as we, we take away the, the issue and we, we pull apart the tissue, we creating, basically we're creating friction, pulling apart a contraction. The body heals itself. But if it heals itself from a cut, it can heal itself from that too. Mm-hmm. But we just have to give it. So basically what I tell people, women to do is stretch the nipple, stretch under there, stretch the scar this way, stretch it this way, stretch it that way, stretch it that way, stretch it all the way around. Same thing with the nipple. I also encourage them to grab the breast from here and pull up. Uh, I encourage them to grab the breast. Whoops. Put one hand on the breast, put one hand here, pull the breast up, and then flex around and move so it opens up the fascia in here. That's stomach, spleen, kidney, stuff like that. So this, by the way, this affects their energy too. Okay, now there's another thing that happens with augmentation that you'll see is that the shoulders tend to roll inward. Mm-hmm. Now the shoulders roll inward, what it's affecting this little line right here. Lung. That's lung. So that means I'm gonna be, if I affect my lung, I'm gonna be more anxious and it's gonna, it's gonna have me processing more grief. Is that a true statement? Yeah, it can be, yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna, because the large intestine goes here I'm going to be processing more of this because this is blocked. Okay, so, so here we have something that they can do for this. And we will do a video for this on how to remediate this, okay? Other health issues? Um, hormone replacement therapy. How do people get off of hormone replacements or hormones that they're taking? Okay, so what do you say normally with HRT? Do you agree with HRT? No, okay. I, I don't see it quite as much as it used to be. At least. Well, I mean, it was really big for about 20 years. Everybody was doing it. Now it's become more bioidentical. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, bioidentical. What do you think about it bioidentical? Uh, I think it's the same thing, but in a more, um, I guess it's a, it's a nicer package for people to take, you know? Right. But it's still... The same thing. Mm-hmm. We're augmenting the body's hormonal cycle, mm-hmm. which the hormones are a reaction to the environment. It's the body's best way of reacting to the environment. It doesn't understand something, so it's, it's misre- misfiring hormones. So if we just make it easy, it's like giving us a crutch. Yeah. So if I wear a crutch long enough, I'm not going to be able to walk. That's right. Okay, so what I, my answer is reduce the stress in the body, reduce it twice a day for 28 days. And if we do that, it resets the stress cycle. So most of the hormone replacement therapy is because the body's been in stress too often. Mm-hmm. We've been firing adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine. We've been firing that as our daily working. That's why I tell people when they get up in the morning, the very first thing I tell them to do is do fascial maneuvers because they're restricted. They wanna, they wanna stretch in the morning. So if, if they wanna stretch and I move through that stretching, what I'm actually doing is that movement through the stretching is causing my body to have stress hormones to move. So that I'm already in sympathetic right in the morning. That's why I do fascial maneuvers in the morning because I don't, I don't get my body into stress first thing. Okay, so HRT is a good one. Anything else? Um, weight gain. Unexplained weight gain or um, water retention, holding on to fluids in your body? Okay, so uh, the body holds fluid. Fluid, water is a universal solvent that takes trauma and cleans trauma out of the body. So when the body's holding water, so like I'll give you an example. Let's go back to organs here. Let's uh, hide, hide, hide. Whoops. Let's just go back and go to the organs. So this is the way I see fat, by the way. So I don't see fat the same way. People can argue with me all they want. But at the end of it, they usually end up with something in their body. All the ones who argue with me usually have something in their body that doesn't work at some point, And they're sick and they want help with it. And then they stop arguing. Um, that's usually what happens. Because I get a lot of practitioners that would argue about this stuff. But, okay, here's the what I see. Okay, if I have a lot of anger, my body's going to hold water around the liver. If I hold that water, it sits there waiting for the emotion to release. If the emotion doesn't release, which is the toxins, then that water is going to stay there. If the water stays there long enough, it's going to start to get putrid and brownish. If it stays there really long, it's going to get whitish. And it's going to become another tissue, kind of like calcification starts to calcify a bone. Does that make sense if I said it to you? Yeah. Never thought of it that way. That? 
Yeah, I see it all the time. Because if somebody who's, who's got a lot of anger issues will have swelling around their liver or a lot of desire or worry issues will have swelling around their stomach. So I see that all the time. So if we need to even take out the liver here. And there we go. There's your nasty gallbladder or your pretty gallbladder, however you want to say it. But So if we take the stomach right here, and I'll see this a lot. Um, I'll see that, that there's a lot of water around here. So this part of the body quite often... What I'll see is this part of the body here gets swollen so that it causes more swelling on the left side. And, but that what actually causes a rotation of the rib cage. So a torquing of the rib cage, which is then resolved in the neck or the hips again. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what I tell people is, is that when we do fascial maneuvers, what we're doing is we're causing rotation here, rotation here, and rotation here. Those rotations are going here, 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 and then these are balancing off. These are like mitigating the differences. So this is why when we do this, it opens up the fascial layers here. So it opens up the diaphragm so that they can get movement there again. And movement is what mo moves it out. So if it's stuck there, I find that the organ will get stuck. And then I remove the organ, then the body starts to move. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to something you said when you're telling people to do the fascial maneuvers twice a day to really reduce your stress because yeah. a lot of times you know people are all about they need to reduce their stress get rid of stress so they're always thinking something external or something they have to change but the beautiful thing about these exercises is that they're actually literally reducing the stress in their body mm -hmm. you know and reducing you know the nervous system reset and then through that when they become clear they might make choices okay externally. yeah but I think that advice for people is always hard, is how do they reduce stress because they're overwhelmed by stress. Right. When you give them that tool that they start to, it's that connection they'll start to regain in their body again of when stress is actually reducing, but it's inside of them. Right. So what I like to say to people is stress isn't work or your job or the government mm -hmm. or that's stressor. Stress is my reaction to it. So my body's ability to react to it, it determines the amount of stress. Mm -hmm. and but that, that's not always obvious until someone can actually experience it. Right, they have to experience it. Themselves. Yeah, they have to feel it. Yeah, that's actually what you felt when you first did fashion maneuvers. Absolutely. Reduction of stress. So if, from a, if as, a, as a doctor, if I was to reduce stress twice every day, reset my baseline, I did nothing else, would that impact my disease? Absolutely. Is there any disease that would not be positively impacted by that well we can see firsthand that stress aggravates any condition right. or disease so that has to be the first step so so by reducing stress we're affecting disease positively mm -hmm. okay absolutely. absolutely fantastic and not being able to give people something uh, that can actually do that right from a Western medical model and yes people can come in and do therapies to have it temporarily feel less stress it might last a day or a few days but you know giving them a tool that they can do easily right that's why fashion maneuvers because you can do it it's anywhere amazing. anytime that's why it's such an amazing so uh here's a question does working out reduce stress it's another stress on it's the an body. it's an it's, animal it's a catabolic action yeah, it's a stress on the body but people are just it's an outlet because they don't know how, what to do with all that pent up you know, energy. energy so, so here's anxious people love to run yes right? yeah that's what we say they're in their primitive state if they have to work out in order mm -hmm. to to feel good mm -hmm. so then here's one does yoga is it anabolic or catabolic mm -hmm. because yoga actually works the muscle the muscle skeletal system when you work it it causes stress so basically mm -hmm. if i give my body enough adrenaline or epinephrine and cortisol if i give my body speed it slows down right so those, those drugs are speed. So if we are actually doing yoga, we're actually stressing the body to then get a relaxation. Mm. Where fascial maneuvers, we're actually releasing the, the restriction without uh, engaging the muscle skeletal system. So we're not engaging the hormones to do it. Every other movement process engages the hormones to do it. Probably yoga forms where there's more breath. Oh, that would be yin, yin, yin yoga. Mm -hmm. Yin yoga, slow movement. Because... If we're, if we're trying to hold a muscular form, then that causes the shaking. That's when they try to hold it and they can't shake and they shake. But I will say personally, I, I did do a yin yoga practice that I enjoyed 
but I got an injury from it because there were fascial restrictions up higher as I'm trying to stretch into something lower. The hamstring gave out. And that was on your left side? Yeah. But didn't we just fix that today? Well, yeah, but these are my old injuries. Right? Yeah, so but where it was bound up before. How long ago was that? This was a few years ago, three, four years ago. And we just fixed that today. Oh, yeah, but my left side has been compounding over time. Yeah. You know, 95% of it resolved just through doing all the things, and then you kind of touched, touched it, yeah. the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, that's a really, really good point. That's a super, super good point. Okay, what else do we got here? There is a hot topic, PCOS. Mm. What do you say about PCOS? Well, I mean, we're traditionally thinking it's hormonal. Right. Mm -hmm. And do you think that? Do you feel that way? Mm. Anything hormonal is an imbalance in the body. So, yes, in some ways it's about restoring. Yeah, so yeah, so so we clear congestion in the lower pelvic region, we get rid of PCOS. So we have our lower reset, which is all the lower maneuvers. That would be a good one for PCOS. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so it's all about re 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 removing restrictions in the lower, in the pelvis, and the lower part of it. So that would be a good one. Mm -hmm. um, so PCOS, what I say is the lower reset, uh, one to two times per day, um, getting the body hydrated, uh, Dietitian with IRC Moss. Uh, if you can do it and you can afford to do it, get our foundation bundle of supplements. Do that every day for 28 days, one to two times, and then mm -hmm. usually uh, we can't say it cures your disease, but we can say that tens of thousands of people that had PCOS no longer have symptoms. That's what we can say. <laughs> what's another one? Um, birth control. Oh, what's Big your one. opinion on birth control? Yeah. This would be good. So, for, okay, what's the medical, what's the established medical opinion on birth control? Oh, it's prescribed freely. Yeah, and what do we prescribe it for? Uh, regulate periods, acne, first contraception, they'll give it towards the perimenopausal years, right, to even out menopausal, perimenopausal readings. It's so basically, reason. basically it's like, it's like, uh, it's like aspirin for women, <laughs> right? So, so what? It's a uh, convenient way to uh, manipulate. So, if I was doing steroids, is that effectively the same thing on my body as doing birth control over time? Yes. Yeah. So, putting hormones into my body exogenously. So, it's the same as a steroid. It has the same kind of effect, maybe slightly different organs in it, because one is is driving more testosterone and one's driving more estrogen. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to be good. Now, what about the what about the smell factor? What about the women being able to smell their partner? So, so going off of birth control and then changing their relationships. Have you seen that in your practice? I don't know firsthand if I've seen that, but I've certainly seen that number of women who cannot control. Yeah. And for good reason. Yeah, for good reason, yeah. And definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. So what are the other forms of birth control what? that you that you recommend? Uh, really, it's just natural. Uh, Knowing your own cycle. Yeah, but you know, with that is always the potential that it might not work. And yeah, but if I if I knew exactly when I'm ovulating, if I could feel it, and I knew exactly when I wasn't, yeah. then I would be safe. Yeah, this is about women's wisdom inside their bodies. Right. So we've taken away the wisdom inside the bodies because we no longer teach them what it feels like when you're ovulating. So if you don't know what it feels like when you're ovulating, you just start ovulating. Especially if you've been given these things at a young age. Right, right. Okay, that's a good one. Um, osteoporosis and osteopenia from Lydia. Okay, Lydia, osteoporosis, osteopenia. Uh, pina. So here's my. So when your when your body's not working properly, your blood is going to regulate the body. It's like um, think about the radiator in your car. It makes the car the engine colder when it's hotter outside and hotter when it's colder. Your blood is supposed to be neutral, and when your blood doesn't have enough calcium in it, it's going to get the calcium. Where does it get the calcium from? Your bones. So if you're trying to deal with osteoporosis and osteopenia, and you're giving yourself more calcium, you're causing calcification in your body. It's not going to work. That's not how the body works. What you do is you go to why you're, why you're having a deficiency in the first place. Um, if you want more calcium in your body, start loading up your silica. Diatomaceous earth or silica from horsetail, immediately you'll notice the difference in your bones. Your bones have more silica in them than they do calcium, but we're not taught that. 
So we're taught to give our body something that we're deficient. But if our body's deficient, that's our body's way of managing or coping with whatever else is going on. So if we give our body something we're deficient in, like if I go take a lab test, that's why I don't like doing lab tests anymore, and I'm deficient in C and D, I, and I start taking C and D, my body is not going to then produce the right response somewhere else. So I'm gonna have an issue that builds up. Fair statement, right? Anything um, else? Yes, we've got lots of people coming in. Um, endometriosis. Endometriosis. Maybe we should describe what that is first. Um, so the uh, endometrial is inside the uterus. So it comes outside of the uterus, and it's like a webby kind of material. It goes inside the pelvic floor, and it can twist around the organs and all kinds of crazy stuff. But why does it come out of the pelvic floor, do you think? First of all, endometriosis, have you noticed? that its incidence has been rising, like you almost didn't see it 20, 30 years ago, and today it's like 20% it's like of the population of women. Have you noticed that change? There's certainly a lot of women who are having troubles with their cycles, yeah. and uh, perhaps more endometriosis you know, in my practice. Mm -hmm. so, so we have endometriosis coming up. So, so basically we have all this fiber stuff that squeezes out of the uterus, goes into the pelvic floor, and then when we have our cycle, it has the same behavior as the tissue in the uterus. So it expands and contracts. Now this is when I say, people say the uterus doesn't expand during um, to your cycle. Well then what is the endometrious tissue? What it's, what's it doing? So if you had that uterus, remember what it looked like, what if we just squished it? Wouldn't that push tissue off? Yeah, talk louder? Oh, you have to talk louder. Yeah. I always talk louder. <laughs> so, so can you imagine that this, the tissue is getting squeezed out of it? <clears throat> so that would cause from pelvic issues. Now, what are women doing today? They're making their butts bigger while working out. They're tightening up their abs. They're getting ripped and shredded, which is dehydrated of their organs. We know that. Super bad for them. Um, everybody who looks like they're in shape um, has, in my, in my experience, has massive dehydration of organs and organ issues and hormone dysregulation. Every single person I, that looks aesthetically pleasing. So when you squeeze that abdomen, squeeze the pelvis, and you put a massive weight, what they're doing is they put weights on like this, and they bridge up like this, causing all the pressure right in here, right over the uterus. That's gonna squeeze the uterus. So what I've noticed is lots of women who are athletes, um, like that kind of athlete, like we're talking fitness models, IFBB, Models are trying to, I noticed that they have the highest incident of endometriosis. Interesting. That's my experience mm -hmm. in my practice. But this is clinical experience. It's by what you see. Yeah, this is only what I see. Yeah. And I've seen 15,000 women personally, or sorry, 15,000 people, 70% of the women personally I've seen, spent two hours or more with them, seen them through course of treatment, watched them through various, of one of the 52 practitioners. So I've, I, that was my experience. And, I, and I, the thing that I feel is different about my experience is that I got to see, I, I talked to everybody for an hour and a half to two hours before we touched them. Now, can you imagine doing that in a medical practice? That does not exist. <laughs> <laughs> so endometriosis, the first thing I say that even if we do the surgery, quite often it recurs. That means that the pressure, something's squeezing it out, so we have to take yeah, the pressure off. the root of it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so what we do for endometriosis is the lower reset. Um, and uh, on the psoas release, which is really an organ release, you do the same thing over your bladder. You do that every single day. You do that before you come into your cycle. There's a set of oils, if you go to our YouTube channel, and there's a essential oil wizardry, there's a workshops, there's one on women's health issues. There's a set of oils in there, one called Moon Cycle, that you rub on uh, two days before your cycle and through your cycle. Super important, it calms, it calms the body down, it calms the hormones down, it calms regulation. And there's some other ones in there, I'll let you go and watch the, the podcast. But here's what's really important for guys who can't sleep, put moon cycle on your feet. In 30 minutes, if you can stay up after 30 minutes with moon cycle on your feet, yeah, write me a note, I'll bring you up. I mean, it crashed me online. I couldn't even stay up and put it on our feet. And Jason and I just were right in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> couldn't even stay up. So, so that's what I recommend for endometriosis. Uh, you have to have your body hydrated because the tissue that you're trying to get to go back in, if it's dehydrated, the fascia is dehydrated, it creates adhesions in those fascial layers around the organs. It needs to be slippery and slimy and be able to get back into, the, into there. And I, my experience is, is that that tissue is still attached in there, usually. So it can come back up. You're saying up. the implanted 
endometrial tissue will go back into the uterus? I have it sometimes. I think it's if it's not cut off, if it's not separated from the uterus, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can come out and sometimes it leaches out and separates, sometimes it's cut off. But if they've done the surgery, they've already cut it. It's like tentacles coming out. Mm -hmm. Those tentacles were wrapping the baby before. Mm -hmm. Thought. Yeah. I mean, I may be wrong, but. Yeah. But they must have um, uh, repeatable patterns. They, they do. The yeah, the endometriosis. Um, it's usually really, really thin, narrow, trying to pressure, doing a lot of ab workouts, doing a lot of, got to have those abs, the six pack abs. Like that is the, that's the indicator that when somebody comes in and they say they have endometriosis, I just look at their body type. That's the first thing. And the other one can be excessive weight causing pressure when I sit down. So excessive weight pushing down on the uterus mm -hmm. can also cause a symptom. So for women who are very, you know, focused on that fit aesthetic, mm -hmm. doing fashion maneuvers, yeah, so what it does is it, well, fascia maneuvers automatically start to expand the tissue and expand, it, it, takes, it takes all of the contraction because what that is, is they're contracting and dehydrating muscle tissue and fascia tissue around there to create that look. But you can still have a slim look. There's a difference between a woman who's thin or a guy who's thin and has, you can see abs and one that's ripped and shredded and stuff like that. There's a very big difference. So it's not all, it's not working out that's causing the issue. It's the working out, the constant pressure, the focus on one area. Because if you work out the whole body, no problem. But if you work out to get your butt bigger, something else has to, has to compensate. Right? Can we reintroduce our guest today? Um, there's a lot of people that's coming on. It's like, who, who's, the, who's the fabulous woman? So, <laughs> I'm Ija Sun. I'm from North Vancouver, Canada. And uh, I'm a family doctor and I'm trained in medical acupuncture. Yeah. Pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's because you don't get a lot of doctors trained in acupuncture. No. So you're the perfect balance between yeah. Eastern and Western. And then I was introduced to the Human Garage in early January of this year. And after a few days of, of doing it, I noticed uh, I could tell immediately what the effect was, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, working on subconscious layers, trauma, but after three days of doing this, literally, I met Gary very randomly and serendipitously in a restaurant in Vancouver that I never go to. And, uh, you know, such resonance and such passion. Of course, we had to meet again, and so here we are in Mexico. And thank you. What, what has it done? What has doing fashion maneuvers done for you? Now, you're, you've gone through the 28th and reset. So, what was your experience in going through that as a medical doctor? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm a medical doctor and I work energetically, holistically. So what I noticed was as a physical modality, it actually um, puts one through a journey similar as if I was doing an energetic treatment. Sure. But it was coming from the physical handle. And so not only were the physical uh, restrictions and limitations from old injuries unwinding, the emotions that are stored in the body, the subconscious, old traumas that would release uh, and then really feeling the contrast of the reset you know it's such a good word the nervous system resetting you know the past few years have been pretty you know pretty challenging rough. and yeah, traumatic. especially on you yes yeah. especially on me i'm not a, a a conventional doctor so i wouldn't have conventional views during the pandemic and uh and that comes with its consequences so with that amount of stress and challenge you know that I've never faced in my lifetime till this point. Uh, I was definitely in a form of fear, stress, response, and um, being reset out of that. I can say, clear as day, I've been in a parasympathetic state consistently. So, what has that done to your life? What has it done to your like your the way you feel about yourself? Well, um, it took off the feeling of being oppressed and burdened uh, to becoming lighthearted capacity for joy to return, to laugh, to feel playful, to feel younger in my body. I told you I, I came into skiing in my adulthood and to be able to ski moguls and trees and do big drops. I never did that. And this is just actually, this is during the 28th day reset? Yeah. While you're yeah. in the process? Yeah. I mean, in December I went skiing and in January I went skiing. It was a completely different experience. I thought, what was I doing before? Right. Because now I feel like I'm actually skiing, skiing. and having fun and I'm actually feeling young and 
you know, I can watch my daughter go, oh, this is her experience. She's not thinking, she's just going Doing. with the flow. And it's just been being in flow, being fluid. And that also means on a energetic or spiritual sense, you're more uh, guided and connected. You know, what has it, it done with your relationships? Well, something that I was lacking before, you know, was boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to say that during the, uh, the maneuvers, I started to understand and feel this organic sense of what boundaries were in a way that I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't consciously trying to create hard boundaries. It was just, you know, this beautiful sense of knowing where I was, my groundedness, and what was okay and what wasn't okay, and being in truth. And that's really, I think, the theme of the last three years is how to be in truth, in integrity, and to not be in fear. And so, you know, these maneuvers came at a time in my life. Where that was there's, a, there's a lot of fear in the medical profession. And without going too far into it, because I don't want to focus on the problem, we've got 30 to 50% of the healthcare workers worldwide gone. Um, the next two years, uh, how can the system maintain itself? Yeah, Practically. It's like, yeah, it's like we have more people going into the system than we did. We have uh, 30 to 50% less people to manage it. Um, it's not healthy. So that's so. What has this done to? What is doing this practice done to your relationship to what you do for work? Um, well, I think it helps me. You know, you can't change anything external to yourself. Things are happening around us, but what we can change is what's inside, mm -hmm. and what's happening here helps us to then respond to what's out here. And so, so did, did, did you have hope um, for your practice and what you're doing, let's say, six months ago? No, zero. What, 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 what do you have right now? Like, what do you feel? I have passion and inspiration. Yeah. And I feel that there's a way forward, an evolution that can come. And so, you know, instead of putting my energy into fight or trying to maintain something that's old and broken, yeah. recognizing that that's perhaps what needs to happen so that something new can come forward and I think meeting you and what you're doing also that resonance of what's needed mm -hmm. moving forward what's in, going to empower the most people you know mm -hmm. uh, empowering people creating communities of empowered people taking their their health and well-being into their own hands helping others this comes organically as soon as you feel something inside of yourself you want to help, you want to help you know yeah. and that's beautiful yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. sure it certainly is <clears throat> yeah. So um, Jade is here, who is Enja's daughter. Hey Jade, come on over. And she had a, she was watching the comments and she had a comment for her mom. Hey Jade, say hi. <laughs> so people want to hear more of your thoughts on the subject. Um, so the, the next subject was fibroids. So she, they want to hear more kind of your thoughts. Around fibroids? So, sure. Uh, well, I mean, in Western medicine, they're considered growths of the, the uterine wall, the muscles, uh, hormonally fueled, um, and they tend to come up during perimenopause where there's more spiking of estrogen. Uh, but like with anything, I think, you know, from a Chinese medicine model, I always see it as um, localized phlegm, you know, in the uterus, again, things that require balancing and clearing. What is fun? Yes. Pathogenic substance, accumulations, so toxins. Does the, does the fascia have phlegm in it? Mm. So, and, and if the body's made up of all layers, uh, 10 layers, uh, the skin, the muscles, and the bone, then every organ is a vortex. We now know that the heart is, doesn't pump blood. It's actually a dam, and it's a vortex. If you take a piece of tissue and you fold it up, um, does anybody got a cloth? Or something like that. There's a great, there's a great video that we show on. Uh, do we show it in the 28 day reset? The heart? No, we show it in the lifestyle artist program. Yeah, this will work. So, so what happens is the uh, world famous doctor dissects a heart, and can you see this? And so what he does is he rolls it. He rolls up the heart, and then he just starts rolling it like this. And so he goes like this, and he says, "What do you got here? You got a heart." 
intake valve, outtake valve. Mm -hmm. So what he does is he unravels the heart. It's the first time that somebody validated my theory of the body, but he doesn't know he's doing it. He showed all, he opened up the heart like this, and he says, this is really a vortex. And then he opens it up, and then he shows, he peels back the layers, and there's layers of muscle tissue, layers of fascia in between. Mm -hmm. So every organ is made up of fascia. People go, what is fascia? It's not a coating. I mean, when, when, the, when the baby's in utero, uh, there's a little ball of plasma, and then the muscle skeletal system grows in there. So we're grown in fascia. Yeah. We are fascia. Yeah. That, that, when you mention that, that's what makes the most sense. And, you know, so a fibroid. Layers of fascia get blocked. Each layer, the way I see it, belongs to an organ. So if, so if it's fear, if it's anger, if it's sadness, that organ in that layer starts to contract. Because we know fascia contracts emotionally. So, it doesn't, so if it contracts my body out here, it means that my organs and my uterus would be contracted too. So it's contracting, but not everything is contracting. So that causes a blockage and fluid doesn't move through it. And if flow doesn't move through in, in Chinese medicine, mm -hmm. we're going to get stagnation. stagnation, which is a fibroid. So that's, that's my working theory. Yeah. How's that sound? Yeah. The convergence is beautiful. So yeah. the way I treat a fibroid mm -hmm. is the lower reset, uh, the hip release, uh, opens it up, keep, keep the tissue moving. Um, I, I tell women to cast their oil pack. Um, tell them to do it one hour a day for 28 days. I tell them to put on the castor oil a little bit of frankincense oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, that with the movement, um, every single person that I have personally worked with has had the fibroid go away by themselves. And most of them within 28 days. Yeah. Yeah, and I've never, had, I've never had one that has it yet. So I mean it's possible, but not one that I personally worked with. Does that sound reasonable to you? It does, and it's more interesting. I have a patient who had the embolic embolization of a fibroid. Yeah, right, sure. And so it just cuts off the blood supply to a fibroid. But all it did was that fibroid started to calcify. Yeah, and calcify. It just became a... Yeah, again, like anywhere water collects, yeah. the body's going to send calcium. That's how our, like, that's mm -hmm. people get a, a toes. Um, toes. Big toe. Hand, uh, oh, uh, bunions? Bunions. Mm -hmm. And bunions is, is that when the hip goes off, that one hip goes higher, the hip More that's pressure. lower has to pressure on the inside, so that creates pressure in the fascia, so water rushes there. As the water rushes there, it starts to calcify. And the more, the more their body's off. So calcification, I've noticed, happens with uh, fluoride. I've noticed it happens with glyphosate. I've noticed calcification really heavily happens with those. And I've noticed that when I remove those and, and hydrate the fascial tissue and move it, the calcification goes away. So as long as the bone hasn't calcified, I notice that the, cal the fascia around the joint calcifies first, and then I can't move it. That's just causing more of an issue, and it's a progression until all of a sudden I've got arthritis mm -hmm. and the joints are big. And that happens in internal joints, too. Mm -hmm. This is the different way of looking at it. So where does the calcium go? Uh, you, you remember, the, remember the picture of the uterus that I showed you? I don't want to show it on here because I got a warning on social media never to show it again. I showed you a calcification of the uterus. That's what it is. It's in the fascial layers. You know, it, it's, it's, it's in the water. It's like, if my, if my water in my body is too calcified, like, oh, I have too much calcium on a rock, it leaves this white tissue, mm -hmm. or this white substance mm -hmm. on the rock. It's no different than our rocks. Our body's the same. Mm -hmm. So if the water is too calcified, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start to collect. Mm -hmm. Calcium collects the calcium. And here's one. The bones get too close together in the body, they fuse. So why don't the bones in our teeth fuse? Mm. I mean, I mean, I'm going down deep rabbit holes. Yeah. But when I go down the rabbit holes, it provides an answer, and I'm going through the issue of my own tooth. What do you think about me doing this? Not fixing it. Well, I think your body is a living laboratory, and so you're going to see what happens. Yeah, I am going to see. I could be right, I could be wrong, but I'm, no, I'm in no apparent danger. I don't have any infection. You can, you can see it. It, it, it's, it's dark there, it's chipped, it's related to my gallbladder, lots of resentment in my life, especially towards my father on my right side. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dad, if you ever watch this, the, the resentment was there, it's not there anymore. <laughs> it's been worked out. It's been worked out, but... Um, but yeah, so I chose not to do the work because if I go in there and start ripping around and cutting and pulling, it's going to affect the fascia in that area. That was why my face was contorting. 
and that's why my face is now uncontorted. So you're doing the exact opposite of what we're doing in, in our healthcare medical system, right? Everyone wants a quick fix, mm -hmm. make it look good, right? And you're going through the journey of seeing how the body will heal. What is going to be learned here? What are you getting from this experience? So what I got from the experience was all about ego. Yeah, it was ego because it was like how I thought. I was so judgmental. I grew up looking at the human body from an athletic perspective. And, and so I made lots of judgments, good, bad, healthy, not healthy. And you know, my daughter, who, uh, who's, who weighs about 280 pounds, and I, I measured that. I felt like a failure because I felt like she wasn't healthy. But I've since learned, I, I had a, a situation, I'll tell you. I had a patient come in. She's a little bit overweight. And so I would normally tell them when we send the lab work out because they get the results from the lab. And then I would help them interpret the results because I'm not a doctor. So I just interpreted the results. And what I would say is that when you get the report back, there's gonna be lots of red. So just don't worry about it, we'll talk about it, it's normal. And then I got the report back, it was all green. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how is this possible? So I called the lab and said, your equipment's malfunctioning. Fix your equipment. They tested it. We had to retest 20 people we called back in to retest for that day, from our, just from us. Never mind all the other people that they retested. And we retested everybody and everybody's report came out exactly the same. And then I had to deal with it. What is different about this woman than every other woman that year? And the only thing I could point to, because I knew her from social settings, was she was the happiest person that I've ever met. And then I thought, Whoa, so I, then I had another one and another one. I was able to validate that over through another couple hundred women and who were happy and their hormones and their bodies were work, but their weight wasn't where you should have said it was healthy. And I'm like, well, that's a healthy body because like when we do a blood test, I say to people all the time, the blood test is like a speedometer. It tells you how fast you're going. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't tell you how hard your engine is working to make that speed up because a blood test, again, blood's supposed to be normal and but if my if my uh, organs are working extra hard to keep the blood normal so that's like rpms in a car my rpms at 9,000 rpms and yours is at 3,000 rpms in a year one of us is going to look very different mm -hmm. so this is why we started using subclinical testing as opposed to blood as a way because by the time it's in the blood it's pretty much too late fair statement yeah well that's when we pick things up in medicine right? it's always towards the end well you pick it on the end <laughs> Yeah, I, I should ask you the question is, is can, can current medicine describe health? Can, can allopathic medicine define health? No, it can only define how close you are to death. And what is disease? Is the body's not at ease. So if I'm angry, and I'm frustrated, and my shoulders are rolled in, and I got that, is my body's not at ease. If I hold that little bit of anger every day of my life over time, that's going to be a disease that eventually somebody's going to be able to go, if you don't do something, you're going to die. Well, that's where, um, you know, the focus on investigations or tests has been the, the marker of wellness, but we've stopped listening to symptoms. We don't right. like symptoms. We, in Canada, I don't know about anywhere else. Oh, the United States One problem worse. per visit. Right? One problem. You, went, you can't talk about it. Everything's a cluster of symptoms. Right? When Are you issues. seriously one problem per visit? That's all you can go for? Yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's a different system in Canada. Yeah. It's a publicly funded. So if you get paid $30 for a visit, you know, you want to make your visit a little shorter yeah. to make your money. And you can't listen to five different symptoms that don't make sense in an allopathic model. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense, but it may, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, yeah, so what I say to people is that allopathic medicine can only tell you how close you are to death. Um, and then before that, you get a natural doctor who says, well, I, I got some symptoms here. These symptoms are saying, if you don't do something, you're gonna end up going to an allopathic doctor. He's gonna do a test that's gonna tell you how close you are to death. And then before that, you get like a nutrition coach, a health coach, you get a meditator that says, hey, you got these symptoms. If we don't do something over here, you're gonna have symptoms that you're gonna have to go to a doctor who's natural, who's gonna tell you you gotta do something. And if you don't do something, Eventually, you're going to go to another doctor who's going to tell you how close you are to death. So, again, I just look at things in a very simplistic way. So the idea is, is that we're, we're not supposed to sedate our symptoms. We're supposed to keep our symptoms and, and work with them, right? Well, it's about uh, what we've lost is connecting and understanding our bodies. 
right? And right. Instead of worrying about the symptoms, it's more inquiring to understand. Yeah, what is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, because I, I can tell you, honestly, in my life, even over the last 12 years, practicing, I felt something wrong in my body. I'm like, oh my God, I did something wrong. And I know better. But I'm so trained in the, in the philosophy that if I'm sick, well, here's one. So if I'm sick, am I really sick? Because sickness means I'm going to get, go, sickness leads to death. So if I'm sick, am I leading to death? Or am I detoxing? And so when I'm sick, our current version of what we say sick is my body's cleaning itself. So if my body's cleaning itself, what am I sick from? My life. So basically, our lives are sick, and our bodies, and you, how, do you, how about this one? Uh, this is one of my favorite ones as a practitioner. He was completely healthy his whole life. He uh, got diagnosed, and he died in six months. And I'm like, the first statement is, you're not healthy. It, you, the body doesn't work that way. My opinion is, is that when it comes to an internal organ, those organs can dysregulate for 10 to 15 years before they start doing something that really we can't handle. Yeah. And then muscles and movement has got about somewhere around five to seven years. And then all of a sudden, I've got a joint. That yeah. I That's why I always tell patients, if their tests are normal, I'm like, great, you're not in a disease state yet. Now we have time, right? Because there's always, there's this lag time before something becomes disease as you work on. You know, all the, the symptoms are just a sign of, you know, what's out of balance or what needs to come back into alignment and you just work at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Again, what you're doing is beautiful. This is cool. Yeah. Other questions? So, yes, um, earlier when Jade was a asking her question, she wasn't actually on video, so they wanted to see Jade. Come so come here, around Jade. in the middle, first of all, and say hello. Hi, Jade. There we go. You? Now she's there. I'm 11. And you are, what's your sign? I'm a Scorpio. You're a Scorpio, so you can't lie to Jade. And she's a master level Scorpio, too. She's a 26 degree which means that she knows how to get stuff done and she knows every bit of emotion, right? How's your mom been? Has she been, has she been different the last couple months since she's been doing this? Definitely. What did you notice? Well, when we go skiing, usually she avoids all the stuff that's not... That's fun. <laughs> pretty much, but she actually did it. Like when, I don't know, she's just gotten better and I've noticed She's just funner, too. She's funner? And has she, has she been happier? Yeah, definitely. Mom got pretty serious the last few years. Yeah. So you saw her during the pandemic get really freaked out. Yeah. Right? What was she doing? Well, she was just like blowing up at me and my dad a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, but that's normal because you're, she's taking all the energy from patients who are fearful and stuff like that and doesn't have a practice to get rid of it. So, and, and that's changed quite a bit? Definitely. So you're happy she's doing that for me? Yes. <laughs> so there are tens of thousands of women every day that get a hysterectomy. Do they need the hysterectomy? Is it the long-term effect of a hysterectomy? Like the hormones, all that kind of stuff that goes with it? What do you think, think about that? I think it's always good to try what you can, but the thing is, is what? Women, people have tried all kinds of, right? You've tried various things. Yeah, so why, why are we getting a hysterectomy? What's the, what, what leads up to that? Like why, is, why is it that we're saying I've got to remove something? Well, it, it, things have gotten so bad. But what does bad look like? Mm -hmm. Like prolapsing and oh, falling? Well, the and usual causes are excessive uh, bleeding yeah. at, at perimenopause. So often that's one way or if they're fibroids are too big and painful. So there's lots of fibroids, bleeding. Mm -hmm. So we're back down to decompression movements. Yeah. And then cancer, of course, would be the other thing. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, cancer. You want to talk about the big C word? <laughs> what is cancer? There's a good one. Uh, well, the body's inability to clear out, you know, abnormal cells. But we have cancer cells every day, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. um, they happen literally all day long. Yeah. So and why does the body not... should be able to, to handle that. So why doesn't it handle something? Mm -hmm. Stress overload, toxin stress, overload. Toxin. Mm -hmm. So toxin really is just a stressor on the body. It is. So toxins are stress. What about people that say to you, like I get this all the time, I have a lot of wealthy clients, like billionaires. They're like, I have no stress in my life. I say you're stressed out. You ever hear that? Mm -hmm. But you know that they're stressed. Mm -hmm. If my body's physically malfunctioning, that's stress in my life, right? 
Right. So what do you say to somebody like that? I have no stress. Everything's okay. I've got finances taken care of. My kids are okay. I have no problems with money. I'm, I'm a, I don't work anymore. It, it depends if they're actually coming to you for help. Right. Okay. Yeah. If they're not coming to help, then, then don't bother. Mm -hmm. right. That's a good rule too. And this is for you guys. If you're not asking for help, we're not going to help you, by the way. Fair statement? Mm -hmm. I've learned the hard way by helping people, by forcing them to see something, it causes, it just makes the problem worse. People have to get to a place where they're looking for help, and often those are the crises or the severe health challenges that create the opportunity for healing. Right. Yeah, so when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. Yeah, you got to be pretty sick of it. Yeah, people, when they're, when they're fed up and sick of... Uh, uh, whatever it is, they'll seek the help and get the. How about arthritis, chronic inflammation, arthritis, all those things? Okay, so arthritis, we talked about that a little bit earlier. We talked about calcification. So uh, arthritis, uh, what we know is fluoride calcifies the body. We know that glyphosate does. We also know that anger and frustration cause an acidic profile in the body. So we know that calcifies the body too. So uh, my answer is, Hydrate, get the minerals, the atomaceous earth, the silica, Irish sea moss. Those are the bare minimums. If you can't get Irish sea moss, get shilajit, get something else. Like, get minerals, get silica. You, without that right now in today's world, you're pretty much going to have a hard time getting through. After that, take the inflammation down. If you can afford our foundation bundle supplements, our Power Curve 30 is a world's strongest anti-inflammatory by ORAC rating. Um, if you can get that, take it. But if you can't, um, reducing the stress in your body twice a day will take your acidic profile out. As long as you keep it hydrated and you do your fashion maneuvers, everything will work. And drinking more water does not hydrate your body. If you're drinking demineralized water, you are dehydrating your body. So this is one of the leading causes of dehydration is drinking demineralized water, which is basically filtered water. So if you're drinking filtered water, you're going to be putting minerals back in your body or in your water directly. Um, what was it? Oh yeah, it was about um, oh goodness. What was it about? Um, well, there's a question about. Um, I know you t touched on it earlier about menopause, perimenopausal, like you know, the premenopausal people. Is there things that is they it, can do? Is age just age define the time for menopause? No. So do you think somebody do you think somebody can be 60, 70 years old still having a period? No. Well, the standard byline is 41 plus or minus 9. Who created that byline? That's a good question. Okay. So I have women that are in their 50s and 60s coming out of menopause. Is that safe? Uh, from a Western point of view, they'd be worked up to make sure there wasn't an issue, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. So, so, um, so I started with women back uh, 12, 13 years ago, conceiving in their late 40s or the 50s. Yeah, um, that scene is, whoa. I'm like, hey, if you want to do it, I'll prepare the body. It's up to you. I'm not here mm -hmm. to, I'm not a conception. And you're not imposing anything unnatural onto them. You're no. You're not using anything apart from just the body, the body coming into a more balanced, aligned state. So do you think that we're supposed to age? I think uh, aging is just the accumulation of all our trauma. stress and traumas. And, yeah. and so as we start to undo that... Uh, so what have, you, what have you noticed in, in examining the light bit of examining you've done in my body? Oh, pretty what's, neat. What's your hair different? is baby soft. These ears are so supple, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> supple ears. Yeah. And I mean, you know, just feeling... The, it's completely, you know, completely different. It's like working with a baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Basically, one of the biological markers for age is the amount of silica compared to the amount of calcium. Babies have more silica, and we get more calcium as we get older and calcify. Calcification stops movement. Mm -hmm. So, but what we did is we aggressively replaced our silica, and we moved with the body. So I'm three inches taller than I was when I was at the garage clinic. I have my ears feel like it's funny the hairdressers. They go hairstyles. So they go, what's up with your ears? Like, like what's up? With it? It's like they can't imagine because it's all like baby ears. And my 
and my skin's changed, my sleep's changed, my, I have no more, generally I have no more energy dips. I have constant energy throughout the day, which is kind of cool because I'm, you know, 54, and normally my energy would be down, so I've noticed that. So have you seen anybody else in your medical career at my age trending this direction? I mean, sometimes I'll come across people who look youthful and vibrant, and I'll ask what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of seeing people mm -hmm. reverse, I have... Um, well, you can see my pictures from before. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen anybody reverse? Um, I mean, I've been... Only within my own practice, I have one gentleman who's close to 90, and his hair is repigmenting. But oh, fantastic! Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so my hair went to went to uh, repigment. It went darker, and then it went uh, it went salt and pepper. It went darker, and then it went back to blonde. This is my color when I was a kid, like when I was under five years old. Mm -hmm. My hair is going back to my five years. So it's not gray anymore. It's blonde. It's silver. <laughs> Speaking of hair, so a lot of men deal with hair loss. But a lot of women do too. Talk about um, hair loss, hair thinning for women. Okay, first and foremost is fascia. Uh, hair, skin, and nails, all the same thing. So connective tissue, we take the compression and the inflammation out of connective tissue. The Power Curve 30 uh, it works really great for this because what it does is it turns off a heat shock protein called MSK1. It goes inside the cell, turns that, and the inflammation goes off. When the inflammation goes off, we have less resistance to growth. So what I've noticed is, is that helps the, the, the cells have more space, let's just say more space to move around. What we found is the diatomaceous earth it encourages the growth of the regrowth of the fascia tissue. It's a silica, so it's making it easier. So for me, my hair repigmented, uh, Cynthia's hair is repigmented, and she's got baby hairs growing. So honestly, I, I, I believe it, just if you take diatomaceous earth and RC moss and you take it regular, it'll, it'll change. But, if you really want to change your hair fast, do the upper reset. Take the foundation bundle supplement. Do like the hair pull. Have you ever, did, have you ever had the hair pull? Mm -hmm. Have you done it yourself? Yeah. But I haven't done it yet. You want to try it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, this is fun. Okay, so the hair pull is really, really fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up here. We're going to get a good amount of hair. We're going to get right in here. We're going to pull it up. So twist it. We're going to twist here. And then push down. Breathe. There it goes. You can do this on yourself too, Gary, can't yeah. you? Yeah. How does that feel? Ooh. Yeah, lots of tinglings and blood flow. Yeah. Lots of tingling and blood flow. Yeah. Look, look around. The zero. Brighter. Brighter. Mm -hmm. Optics change right yeah. away. So, mm -hmm. medically, scientifically, how would you describe the reason why you're brighter? I have a reason. So I wondering what you're. You know, in Western medicine, I would never experience that, but in doing acupuncture, the vision is one of the things. Right, right. right. So, do you know why? Mm -hmm. Do you have a reason or an acupuncture? Energy, blood flow. Okay, energy, blood flow. Okay, yeah. So, let's talk about processing power in the body. So the brain uses a sight, sound, touch, taste, hearing as a way to understand the world. So when the brain gets occupied doing other tasks, it takes away powers from those very rich senses. Mm -hmm. And so when we take away a stressor on the body, we get it back into our sight, sound, touch, taste, mm -hmm. hearing. So food will taste better. And uh, especially around the head. And here's one about the ears. The ears take 10 times more bandwidth from the brain processing power than the eyes do. When, and Teresa Bullard, uh, if you're out there, Teresa Bullard, you'll probably hear this sometimes. She's a quantum physicist who studies the Hermetica, who's on Gaia. I'm sleeping with my headphones and ears, and she says, that she said that. I'm like, I wake up and, and like literally at four in the morning and I'm like, I hear it because I'm sleeping with the headphones in. That's what I did to learn all this stuff. I just slept and listened. And, and I got up and I'm like, ear has fascia. Fascia, I go to the mirror, grab it, start pulling my ear and that, and I'm like, boing, my cycles, my neck loosens up, I have energy, and I'm like, oh my gosh. And this is um, developing the spiritual aspect of ourselves. When the body is, has less stress, these other capacities can Right, so we actually not only visually see more, 
we see more in our perceptions, in our emotions. We see deeper into the situation. So sight is not only physical, it's also emotional and it's perceptual. If I have diminished capacity in my body, I can't see. This is why when people do fascial maneuvers, they come out and they go, oh my God, was, it all, was that person always an asshole to me? <laughs> or was it, was, or is, was it just me? Or are they being different today? Or was that person always that sweet? Did they always that care? Mm -hmm. So I notice more details in the world around me, which makes sense. Can, um, Gary, you and I had a conversation the other day, pretty extensive about autoimmune, and your view was it's BS. So can you kind of talk about autoimmune and just all the things, yeah. have your views about that? So what is an autoimmune, yeah, like what is the Western definition of autoimmune? Uh, it's the body attacking itself, its own tissues. Okay. And, dysregulated. And it usually comes, Western view is, why does the body do it in Western? <laughs> They don't, they don't explain it. They don't know, but they'll show again a lot of strong hey, drugs. To Chinese, that. Chinese. So they suppress your immunity. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. So, yeah. so Chinese medicine, alternate medicine, how do they describe it? Dysregulated immune system usually means out of alignment. Out of alignment. And maybe to bring back. The okay. So if if food doesn't make it from my small intestine to my large intestine very easy, and it builds up a bacterial sludge in the small intestine, that's going to cause the same behavior, right? So what we noticed is I noticed people with autoimmune disease that came into the human garage all of a sudden got autoimmune disease cured or reversed. Because what we're doing is we're physically manipulating the tissue and getting the GI tract. The belly button untorque as a practitioner, do this. The belly button untorque is super powerful because um, it, it opens up back in here the ileocinco valve release, which we ask people to do every day. So what we say is restore the flow autoimmune goes away. Um, why do you think the small intestine, why do you think it becomes permeable? Like the, so bits of food get into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Leaky gut. Mm -hmm. uh, stress. Yeah, stress. Stress is one. What kind of stress? Uh, emotional. Emotional will do it. What if I give you a chemical reason? Yes. Yeah, so basically, the way that a pesticide works is it actually doesn't kill the insect. What it does is it erodes their stomach so they die of starvation. So on lower levels, it erodes our stomach so that the food becomes permeable, the stomach becomes permeable and it leaches into the bloodstream. So basically, just because we're spraying the food like insects to get the insects off, it means that you're eating the same stuff that they sprayed on the insects to kill them, it does the same thing to your anatomy, basically. I mean, yeah, there's some differences in between the insect and us, but at the same mechanism, it's the eroding the stomach and eroding the small intestine, the absorption mechanism. So yeah, autoimmune, it's not bullshit. I, I, I just, I, I overly grossly exaggerate things to make it, it it's, it's a notification of symptoms, but it doesn't need to be there. And I've noticed it's progressive, it starts off with, eczema, rashes, rosacea, when girls are like 12, 13, 14, they start putting creams on their skin. By, if it comes up, it starts off as an anxiety, depression, uh, around the late teens, 18, 19. By 25, it's like, I've gotta do something, I've got something that's rashing, or something that's going, or something that's either emotional or physical. By 30, it's stopping them from doing something in their life. Mm -hmm. And that's when I usually see them. That's the progression I see. And so what we're doing is we open up the small intestine, the 28 day reset. Um, what we do is we, op what you went through. We open up the intestines, open up the flow, and then we send in with the supplements, like a rotor river goes right in. What happens is we put the diatomaceous earth that has little diatoms. They're like little exfoliation balls that go in the small intestine. They exfoliate, they scrub the scour the walls of the small intestine. Then we put a whole bunch of mass enzymes in there from bio-optimizers, bio mass enzymes, Amazing, it's a prolytic enzyme that's patented. And what it does is it takes all that scouring that we do and then it eats all of it. And so that's why the first time people take the 25 mass enzymes, they're usually go, I got so much energy. Because their body's eating the food that was hard. <laughs> and it didn't digest properly the first you know, 20, 30 years. So this is why I say autoimmune, is, it's not bullshit, it just doesn't have to be a disease. It's only a disease if you're not treating it, if you're working with it, getting the flow back in your body, it'll go away really quick. And then it progresses to Hashimoto's, 
then it progresses to Reynards, then it pro pro or RA, then it progresses to Reynards, or, or Reynards before, depending on where it stands. And I find that people who are Cancer, Cancer Moons, get Reynards. Mm -hmm. People who are Virgos get uh, alopecia and, and vitiligo. So I found even by, by sun sign that, and moon sign that, that I had different outcomes of the autoimmune. Interesting. Yeah, that's kind of, because we tracked it. We looked at all 10,000 patients that time with software. We said, okay, what do they have in common? And we started noticing that all these different astrology signs had different behaviors in the body. Um, and that's a whole other course. We're going to show you this stuff. Do you think it's BS? Wait till you see what I know. So we have time for just a couple more questions. Okay. Um, we've been live for like two and a half, almost two hours and 15 minutes. So um, first of all, thyroid. That's a hot topic. Um, hot topic for lots of women for sure. Yeah. And men, but lots of women, so. Thyroid. So why do you, why does Western medicine say that thyroid is well? Do they know? No, they it, treat it. They treat it. They'll just, you know, perimenopausal female. Um, what about all these young know. women that are like 20, like 15, 18, 20, 25, mm -hmm. now getting thyroid surgery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in, in LA, young women, 20 to 30, thyroid cancer, thyroid nodules. Mm -hmm. What's a nodule? Uh, it's, you mean, it's a solid growth. Kind, kind of like a cyst? No, cyst is fluid filled. Okay. nodules are more calcified. So it's a cyst that's been there longer. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so basically it started off as fluid. Yes. So it starts off as a cyst. Oh, no. And then it yeah. becomes, and if you don't assist it, it becomes a nodule. That's how in Chinese medicine, you mean just the stagnation of qi, which leads to the stagnation of blood, which leads to soft masses, which can form into hard masses. And become so what is qi? Energy, vital life force. So if I was to go like this mm -hmm. and open this up for you. A little painful there, but there it goes. How's that feel? Yeah. That's what chi feels like, right? Mm -hmm. So what we did is we, we took and we moved the fascia specifically around a around big part, large intestine, which, which sucks up a lot of our energy and we move it and automatically you get chi flow. Yeah, so we can move chi in our body. Yeah. yeah. It's essential. It's yeah. like a, a marker for well-being. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so thyroid. So what I have noticed is that when people are fashion restricted and dehydrated, their body has to move with a lot of restrictions. So that restriction, they use a lot of adrenaline to move the body. Over time, the adrenals start to wear out. About somewhere around seven to 10 years, the adrenals kind of go flat. And then the body, then the thyroid starts trying to have to regulate, and then we start to get thyroid issues. Now people measuring T1, T2, T3, and it's all, first of all, if you're measuring which ones are not present, you're not in the right, you're not even in the right ballpark. It's why are you having an imbalance in the first place, right? So what we do is we physically, um, get the body moving and breathing and respirating so that the flow is better. We also do the thyroid release yeah. and we also do the stretch on the neck, which is a vocal cord release as well, and opens up the thyroid. The thyroid's like a little bit right here. And, and your thyroid's super important. That's why in the organ reset, it's the only gland that we recognize in your organ reset. Yeah, well, and also you're dealing with the adrenals in the, in the organ reset. Yeah. Did you know that the adrenals on each, uh, that they're different shaped? That they're, mm -hmm. it's phallic on the right side uh, and moon shaped on the left side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know when we breathe it, we get one that gives you energy and one that gives you calming down, sympathetic, parasympathetic. So I did all this research to find out. I said basically they're different shaped, they have to do something different. So I tested it, hormone tested, all this, lab reports and all this, and then my, my wife at the time was a yogi. But, I said, why are you doing that? Oh, the fire. Like, calming me down. I'm like, oh, shoot, the yogis had this thousands of years ago. We didn't know how to call it. So with a thyroid issue, uh, literally hydrate the body, um, uh, do the fascia maneuvers, reduce the stress twice a day. And you can do the, as, as little as a 15 minute stress reset. It still works in the organ reset. I would not miss the organ reset. I would do that twice a day. And you do that twice a day for even two weeks, you're gonna feel different. But get that third weekend, you're gonna start to really feel different. 
Get that 28th day, now your body believes you're gonna continue this action and it lets, it gives you like a leash to go further. What's the other question? Gotcha, so this is the million dollar question for both of you. Um, when we talk about trauma, a human garage, and trauma is a broad word, and we talk about trauma being held in the fascia, and as we unwind, we release our trauma. Can you talk about trauma and what that really means and what that, the effect on it that has sure. on the body? What, how do you see trauma? Let's say Western medicine first. What is trauma? Uh, well, yeah. something terrible that happens and creates distress, perhaps, and but Western, even still with trauma, doesn't really define it. They don't have a definition. It's a syndrome <clears throat> and some medicines. Yes, okay. So in Eastern medicine? Well, trauma is what's unresolved in the body. So bad things can happen. It may not necessarily stay or store if it can get resolved. So when I open this up, there's a flow of chi. Mm -hmm. Was that a resolution or something? It can be, yeah. Yeah, it's a resolution of some sort of a flow issue. Mm -hmm. So would that be removal of trauma? It can be. Yeah. Like, and that release can look emotional or physical, but uh, yeah, there's definitely a stagnation, whether it's something physical, trauma, or emotional, you know, the inability to resolve psychological, physical traumas, effects of. Sure. So the way I see it, uh, very much similar, is that trauma is a stress around the body. Whether it's psychological, emotional, it doesn't matter. If I, if I told you that, uh, if I told you that your husband died, you would go into shock. Your body, every system in your body would capitulate. It would go into shock. And if I was to tell you 15 minutes later, oh, sorry, it wasn't your husband, it was somebody else. Mm -hmm. Your body would start to come out of shock. Now the hormones that put you there are going to be there for four to six hours, mm -hmm. and then the residual effect of feeling it, one of those emotions, is going to be there as well. But it's the mere perception that altered all the biology and the neurology of your body. So if perception is the highest state of awareness, then why do we not deal with perception in healthcare? Mm -hmm. That's too deep. <laughs> <laughs> allopathic. It's the allopathic. And, and you know, in Chinese medicine, we do it, but what I find is like, oh, it's worry, worry, go away, mm -hmm. fix it. Yeah. it. They don't explain it anymore. There's mm -hmm. no concept of what it means. So, so basically, if, if I had somebody that was, that I thought was a beautiful, okay, uh, Jay, do you like Harry Potter? Yeah. Okay, at the end of Harry Potter, who became, who is, who is the enemy in Harry Potter all along? Voldemort. Yeah, at the end, what happened? He died. Yeah, but what about Snake? Well, he also died. Yeah, but he was, he was, a, he was seen as a bad guy the whole time. Uh-huh. And then at the end, we found out he was a good guy. Yeah. So that so what what changed him from a bad guy to a good guy? Information. You saw something different, a different picture. Somebody showed you something that goes, oh, he was really good. Mm -hmm. So then you go back in the story and you go to all the times that you thought he was bad, and you have to rebuild the story. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So your mind logically rebuilds the story with new information. So if you have a trauma and I give you a new information, like, like your mom was punishing you and you think she's punishing you and you can't go out and she's punishing you, but then you find out later on that if you went outside, there's a poisonous gas and you would have died. And you go, oh, she wasn't punishing me. She was taking care of me. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had one of those situations where you realized that she was doing something that was good for you and you didn't think before? <laughs> No, are you not at that stage yet? Not quite at that stage. <laughs> it's like you put your hand on the stove, they take your hand away. You put your hand there, you take it away, because eventually you're going to burn yourself. So, so this is what trauma is. Trauma is about the perception of the event. So what I encourage you to do is uh, one of my uh, producers that I worked with won an Academy Award for a 37-minute documentary called The Lady in Number Six. It costs you about 10 or 10 or 12 dollars to download it and, and watch it. Go get it, The Lady in Number Six. It was about a 112 year old Jewish Holocaust survivor. And she said, she said throughout the time, she goes, um, I've interviewed a 112 years old. She goes, the Holocaust, she lost, she was, first of all, she played music beautifully. So she came, became an uh, entertainer for the Nazis. 
So she lost her husband, her children, her friends, her mom, her dad, everyone. Mm -hmm. And she says at 112 years old, that, that was the best experience that ever happened to her. And I'm like, whoa, how did that possible? How could you think that? And what I realized after really contemplating, it took me about a year and a half to two years to understand that statement. And what the statement was to me meant that with enough time, everything started to make sense. So how much time do I have to have in my life before things are gonna make sense? Do I have to wait to 112 years? Or can I realize that everything that happens in my life happens for a reason, on purpose? And if I can go 112 years in the, in the future and then come back and then have that perception, that thought today, then I can let go of what I thought you were doing that was hurting me. Because it was actually helping me. Like my mom used to pull me by my ear like this, and she's five foot nothing, and I used to, I know I'm gonna get whipped. And then now, fascial maneuvers, this opens up my neck and clears my brain. Now I know that my mom was doing therapy on me for the whole time. Thanks, mom. <laughs> I joke about that, but what if we were just to change the way that we perceived that the events that happened to us? What if things happened to us so that we could get better? What if sickness wasn't sickness? What if sickness was just my body trying to adapt to the environment? <laughs> then I wouldn't be afraid of it. The best questions in life are what if questions. And something my teacher always said was, there's no such thing as right or wrong. There's only perspective. There's only perspective, which is your perception. Mm -hmm. So the perception is controlled by the neocortex. The neocortex is not developed until the ninth month in the womb. So that the emotions that the mother has and her perceptions of those emotions become the child's. They're embedded in our nervous system. So if a, a bad example is if uh, you're pregnant with Jade and, and, a, and a gunshot goes off and you're like, ah, freaking out. And it's like causes all that trauma and stress. Well, later on when she's like 11 years old, she hears a car backfire. It's like, poof, the body viscerally feels that same fear and has the mother's perception. So this is why mothers, it's super important to be in your perception, managing your perception, managing your stress, doing fascia maneuvers through the whole pregnancy. If you go to our, our, our YouTube and watch Happy Body, Happy Baby, watch versions one, two, and you'll see that the, ba the mothers are happier, the babies are happier, there's less stress. Mm -hmm. And if there's less perceptual stress on the baby, the baby adapts to the environment better. Babies used to always be happy. Colicky came somewhere when we started putting, you know, hospitals are where we go to die, but we started doing births in hospitals. So we started bringing people into this world where people go to get fixed or so that they don't die or they die. That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. What do you think about birthing? Should it be at home? Uh, it can be very beautiful at home too. Right? Yeah, it, it definitely can be. I think that's where it should be. Or in water. Mm -hmm. You ever heard of dolph dolphin birthing? No. Look up dolphin birthing. They, the government banned it in the U.S., but they still do it. Anyway, super cool. Look up dolphin. There's a center in Hawaii. Super freaking cool. And they've been tracking the babies that have been born. Higher IQs, better emotional stability. They have a better perception of the world. All that. The dolphins mm -hmm. swim around the mother when she's birthing. And they, they use their sonar to create frequencies, which the baby needs as it comes into the world. Beautiful. Isn't that cool? And uh, by the way, if you have dolphins out there, I'm looking to work with dolphins. My dolphin connection literally just died. And um, so I'm looking for another dolphin hookup. If, you got a dolphin, if you're a dolphin dealer somewhere, <laughs> they're just joking. But if you have access to dolphins, I, I, have a, I have a unique perspective. Why is it that 80 governments in the world uh, don't want us to interact with dolphins by nature and have it as part of their, their, their laws? Hmm. They're the top mammals below the ocean, below the water. We're the top mammals above the water. Mm. I want to talk to dolphins. Mm -hmm. I want to learn, I want to get around dolphins more. I can, I can work with dogs, and anybody here at Learn Fashion Moves, you can help your dogs, but what if you can help your dolphin? <laughs> super, super excited about doing this. Everybody, I think we're, that's it. Uh, we'll do one more, actually. There's one more question that's, or that's actually a topic that's kind of going, um, in this in the chat here um, kind of along the controversial lines about COVID uh, a lot of people obviously have had COVID had the symptoms COVID, of COVID yeah <coughs> um, the symptoms of COVID and then are you know we're trying to heal those okay symptoms. let me talk about COVID but let me not talk about I'll talk about COVID indirectly so I don't have to talk about COVID perfect okay 
So every single disease, every illness, including swine flu, Ebola, and AIDS, and all of that is technically already in your DNA, correct? Okay, so if every disease is already in my DNA, when we get a vaccine, we give ourselves something so that we can have more immunity to it. So if it's already there, then how do I catch it? How do I catch it if it's already there? Isn't it? It's revealed. So here's my view, is that, first of all, flus, viruses, well, we want to avoid viruses. How many viruses does the human body have? 20 trillion. I could be wrong, I think it's 10 or 20. Could be, you, and somebody's gonna fact check me on that one anyway, so whatever it is. It's trillions of viruses that we have. And so we already have, vir viruses are not meant to hurt us. They're meant to help our body, just like a vaccine, get over something so that we build a natural immunity to the environment. If I wanna be healthy, I would, the best way for me to be healthy here is to come and lick every one of you guys. That technically, biologically, that's the best way to be healthy is to lick you. Because then I have, I have all of your bacteria in me, and I'm going to develop whatever immunity I need in that community. You know, I, I don't walk around licking. I might. That would be weird, Gary. <laughs> I'm open to it. <laughs> I, it it's yeah. still, it, it'd be weird. Yeah. yeah. It, I guess it depends on where I lick people. Because if I lick you on the hand or the face, it might be different. Why not dogs do it? Why, I mean, what, what's... So, listen, if you're worried about a virus... That's the problem. The fear of the virus is a million times worse than the virus. Would you say that to be true? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Do you know that 80% of people that sleep with people infected with AIDS for 10 years or more in a study found that they didn't have AIDS and never got AIDS or HIV? And the reason, and how is that possible? If it's co contact, contact, then, then how is that possible? I keep looking at these saying, it's like, why do some people get sick and some people don't? That's if, if it's biological, then technically we should all. We say, well, it's the immune system. But right now, everybody has a suppressed immune system. We're under stress. So if I'm under stress, my immune system is suppressed, right? So I already have a suppressed immune system. So you have COVID, let go of the fact that you have COVID. If you have long COVID, let go of the fact that you've had it for a long time. Get rid of, it's the symptoms that you're dealing with. So if you feel uncomfortable with the symptoms, you can do things to help ease the symptoms. Do the fascia maneuvers. Get the, uh, get the foundation bundle supplements uh, or a diatomaceous earth Irish sheet moss. Start moving your body. Get it out there. All it is is something that stopped you. And, and the, amount, the amount of times that people come in with a diagnosis, like uh, uh, my favorite one is, I have plantar fasciitis. And I'm like, oh, so what you're telling me is your foot has a fascia problem. It doesn't tell me how it happened, why it happened. It doesn't tell me where it happened. It doesn't tell me if it's, it's like we're so hung up on labeling things. Do you want to be labeled stupid or ugly? Uh, maybe smart? I don't know. I don't like to be labeled smart either, but I don't want to be labeled. So don't label me with a diagnosis. A diagnosis is a label. When I give you a label, then it, it immediately restricts you to the understanding and the agreement of what that label does. So I don't want to be labeled. My body is having, is, has a fever, it's hot. My body is expressing, I'm vomiting. Those are all okay. Those are all things that my body's doing to clean itself. If I'm vomiting and I'm in a process of healing myself, is that okay? Sure. I personally would be interested though in seeing patients who had long COVID doing these fashion maneuvers oh, and we, see what happens. We do, we have them. Yeah, because we have um, people, we have people that are reversing rheumatoid arthritis and the big C word and all that. Again, we don't claim that it cures anything, but people are, are reporting back to us with medical reports with symptoms abated or gone. That's, that, that's their decision. But yeah, I, so I just think that when you put the body into function, it'll, it'll reorganize itself. Uh, every single injury that I've ever had in my body, every single malfunction I've had has come back up over the last three years, which is really uncomfortable sometimes. I did a lot of vomiting around um, <laughs> around full moons, which I didn't do this time. It's do you think the vomiting had anything to do with your surgery? Yeah, surgery? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And it had to do with also the trauma and the stress I was putting in my body. I spent 12 years working 14, 15 hours a day giving people belief in my stomach because they didn't have it, helping them fix themselves, I, I, telling myself that I was fixing them and curing them. If I'm fixing somebody, I'm taking their stuff. 
if I'm there to assist them, then, then I can separate myself from them, but I still have to deal with the energy transfer. Mm -hmm. But if they're there showing me something that I have in my body, in my emotions, in my perception, then we both feel. Mm -hmm. So as a practitioner, I, don't, I, I look at the people and say, why are they in front of me? If they have cancer, it's because something about that emotions, that disease is res resident in me. Mm -hmm. And if I look at it that way, then I found that I no longer carry the stress of the treatment. How's that sound? Oh, that's interesting. I know for the longest time I always wondered, why do I see all these concussion patients? But then over time I also realized, hmm, why does everyone walk around as if they have concussion with no history of concussion? And then that's when the understanding of what is concussion, mm -hmm. or what is that constellation of symptoms that is concussion, and it was this being out of alignment yeah. with, you know, you were out of alignment. I had eight diagnoses. Mm -hmm. I lost my ability to use a computer in 2010. Uh, from concussions, so that so I'm very very familiar with that. And in my mind, concussions are one of the simplest things to fix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it really is. So everybody, thank you. Today is a very long time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Can you reintroduce yourself? Because there's been people going in and out, and they just don't know who you are. The people that have come on in the last yeah. 10, 20 minutes. Uh, my name is Ija, so I'm a family doctor and medical acupuncturist from North Vancouver, Canada. Hey. And I uh, was introduced to fascial maneuvers since early January and serendipitously met Gary and I find myself here in Mexico now. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Life-changing experience for both of us. And, I, and if you're a medical professional out there and you are using uh, fascial maneuvers or you're giving them to your patients and you're seeing results, please tell us. It's time. The world right now, we are going into, we are in the largest health crisis in the history of recorded time. The world right now, 80% of the healthcare that used to be done by the mothers and the grandmothers in the neighborhoods has been taken away. After three generations of removing those techniques, they no longer exist and we don't know. Our healthcare system is being overtaxed. People are sicker than they've ever been, have more fear, they're more anxious, they have more disease than they've ever had. Right now, it's time to re return the power to the people. And the way we return the power to the people is we give them evidence and information. And if you're a medical professional of any kind, it's, uh, we're asking you to step up, start sharing. If you're working with fashion maneuvers and they're working, share with us. Come have the discussion, open up this discussion. Let people start to hear the truth and let down your walls. You guys, the, the, the best thing that you can do for your patients today is be vulnerable and say, I don't know when I don't know. Um, the reason why I've learned medicine to the way that I have and healthcare is because I really don't know. <laughs> so I just ask a lot of questions and when I ask questions, I don't, I don't stop asking until they're answered. The one thing I hate to say is if you're ever working with me, never say to me, that's how the body is. If you say that to me, that would be the last conversation I'll usually have with you. Because there's always a reason why this biological fluid adaptive computing system that's so fabulous, that we, that we model every, every system in the world, every computer in the world is modeled after your body. It's amazing. And we're not even beginning to understand it. We're, I feel that I just opened the door to the language to understanding the body. Man Vinder back there is creating the body alphabet. Wait till you see this stuff. We have it coming on, looking forward to uh, what's happening. Um, we're starting to go on our world tour. We'll be around, we're gonna be uh, out in the Philippines, we're gonna be in India, we're gonna be in Kuwait, uh, dealing with stadiums of people. And you know, um, people in America are still too cool for school. Um, but when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, people change. And if you haven't noticed, the people around you are getting painful. If you're a husband and wife, or if you're friends, and you don't feel that you can talk about your health issues with your friends, that's why the issue is, right now, uh, health has become like politics and religion, personal health. So here's a safe place for you to talk about it. We have a community portal. You can ask questions if you get answers. You have medical practitioners, you have scientists, you have healthcare workers, you have moms, dads, you have athletes that are doing this process right now. In the millions all over the world. We were at 30,000 on social media a year ago. Today we're at two and a quarter million. And we're about to 10X that just because it's you who's doing it. Please pass the information, keep sharing, keep helping, but help from your personal experience. Do not read the headlines anymore. Try it out, understand it, and share what you know. Quit, or share what you feel, what you've experienced. Quit trying to share what you know. If you haven't felt it, if you haven't experienced it, quit talking about it. 
We got a comment here from Reldenberg who said, my husband is a family practice physician and has been doing fascia maneuver for two plus months, positive results, sharing with his patients. Thank you, it's thank you, thank you. It up. We appreciate you for doing that. Please post a story, send us a note. You know, we want all the medical professionals in the world to come together. We're going to bring you together. We're going to train you in another way, give you another way of looking at things. And we want your contribution. We want to know what you're seeing out there. When you put fascial maneuvers, we're not claiming to know everything. We just found a process to help the body heal. Now it's your job to do the science and tell us what that healing is doing. So report. Document. Do what you were trained to do. Do what you went to school to do. The world needs you right now. And then anybody that wants to come join us on Sunday, we have a virtual class. Virtual class this Sunday coming up. And we're going to be teaching basics and beginner movements. This is the best way for you to get acclimated with how fashion movements work for yourself. Is that it? Yep. Link in bio. Link on the website. Get a ticket. 20 bucks. Yeah. Link in bio right next to Lincoln Park. Oh. <laughs> hey guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing with everybody. Really, really appreciate your vulnerability and your openness. Absolutely. Okay. We're on a shared journey. <laughs> All right.